Hello, Hello everyone. You just missed you just missed a good a good Clinton story, but anyway, <laughs> it's good stuff. I know. See, it's good stuff. Yeah. Well, we are going to finish up book three. Uh, we're almost done. But a few more things. So turn to page. Uh, let's see, five eighty-two. A little bit more about the voice of Saruman. <laughs> and oh, well, just pick exactly where we left off. Because, again, it's, it's that moment when, remember we said that Saruman tries to lure Gandalf back to his side. Oh, forget about these foolish people. We will rule together, you know, law and order and we know better and all that sort of stuff. And everything looks like, you know, think he's going to win and then Gandalf just laughs at him. You should have been a court jester, he says. And then right where we left off is uh, about two-thirds of the way down page 582. A shadow passed over Saruman's face. Then it went deathly white. Before he could conceal it, they saw through the mask the anguish of a mind in doubt, loathing to stay and dreading to leave its refuge. There's just a moment. I like to call this a redemptive moment. Just a moment when maybe he will repent and come over. There's just an opening. You know, remember, remember, remember what Treebeard said about uh, Saruman? What does he have? He sort of shut windows in his mind. Do you remember that? That line? Was it? In his mind. That's right. They're, they're, they're just shut. Closed. Well, just for a moment, they, they open up. Just a tiny bit. But they closed. What's this? For a second, he hesitated, and no one breathed. It's like we're right there. You know, this is often a human soul is like that. You're on the, you know, what are you going to do? You're on the brink. What are you going to choose? They do not, I'm sorry, then it says, for a second, uh, then he spoke and his voice was shrill and cold. Pride and hate were conquering him. I mean, you know, I suppose Clinton could have said, screw you, God, I'm taking all the money and running. I mean, I mean in, in a sense, that was a moment, you know, not as dire as this moment, but that is, is a moment of decision. And, you know, moments of decision like that lead to other moments, right? You say no to God, and then you keep saying, or you say yes to God, and you keep saying yes. I mean, the, the uh, um, Tolkien's understanding of, sort of human psychology, of the war that goes... Remember, remember that fancy word I wrote on the board a few weeks ago? I think Clinton said you, you like this one. Psychomachia. Right? Psyche is the word that actually means both mind and soul. It's a word that Plato used a lot. And machia means uh, battle or struggle. So it is a mind struggle, an internal struggle in the mind or soul. And we get a lot of that. What's it? Yeah, you're saying that. You should, because it would be cool. Unless, unless Robert beats you to the punch, we'll see. You already have it. Well, you can call it psychomachia, too. Psychomachia against Robert, you know, something like that. Uh, but, the, but look, at pride and hate were conquering him. And we're going to see the same thing with Gollum. I don't know if we'll get that far today. Um, Will, Will I come, come down? down? Does an unarmed man come, come down to speak with the robbers out of doors? doors? I, I can hear you well enough here. I am no fool, and I do not trust you, Gandalf. They, they do not stand openly on my stairs, but I know where the wild wood demons are looking at your command. And again, he's just lost it. He gives way to paranoia. No, I won't come out. I won't do it. Ah, so sad. Uh, he says, then again, he says, I am giving you a last chance. You can leave or think free if you choose. Come. And notice when it says, the treacherous, he says, answered Gandalf wearily. Uh, can somebody identify this line? No, please, don't. That's kind of a hard reference, but some of you might get that. You speak. <laughs> I'm so impressed. You got it exactly right. That's impressive. Oh, you just saw it. That's great. Okay. If you, if you, most of you probably know Willy Wonka. And he's got those kids. They keep screwing up. And he's like, don't do this. And then towards the end, they, they go running to whatever it is. And he's like, no, don't stop. He's kind of giving up. He's just weary. These kids are not going to listen. They're all, even Charlie messes up too, actually. Um, but anyway, <laughs> that's impressive, man. That's good. Mind meld, Vulcan mind meld, right there. Anyway, the uh, <laughs> the re I mean, it, the, 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 there's one reason to see the reboot. Actually, the reboot is a little bit more faithful to the book because in the book, all the kids have both their parents there. Now, I think the old movie made a better choice to just have one parent, kind of focused in it all. And the, and the uh, the new movie at least had that crazy thing in India where they build that. 
palace out of chocolate or something. That's actually in the original. But and it also restored the real story of the of the squirrels and the nuts. In the movie, they changed it to the goose with the golden egg, which I love partly because they were spending a lot of money in color, so it looked better in color. But uh, but yeah, it's still the old the old one's better. Do you know who the first choice was for Willy Wonka before Gene Wilder? It would have been a totally different movie. It was Fred Astaire. He would have been great, but it would have been a different movie, you know? It would have been a very different movie. And I also found out that Gene Wilder wrote one of those scenes. You remember in the movie when Willy Wonka comes out the first time? He's like an old man in a cane, and he stops, and he flips, and he jumps. And, and Gene Wilder, according to him, made that up and said, let me do it, because after I do that, then nobody will know what to expect for the rest of the movie. And it's true, you know? Gene Wilder. Anyway. But, uh, again, again, I'm giving you a last chance. Come on, stop, do it. That, do it. that sounds well, very much in the manner of Gandalf the Grey, so, so condescending and so very kind. I do not doubt that you would find Orthanc commodious and my departure convenient. But why should I wish to leave? And what do you mean by free? There are conditions, I presume. Right? And, and again, it's like, come on! You, you, you just, again, he, he blocks every chance for his salvation. He just stops every single chance. He won't listen. Right? Uh, but he says, you may go free wherever you want. He says, but you will first surrender to me the key of Orthanc. And, and that, that sounds like a uh, ceremonial thing, but it, it's a real thing. I mean, you can't get in there without the key because it's absolutely... In fact, that's why... Do you understand? Why is it that the tree that, that the ants are able to destroy everything, but they can't destroy Orthanc. Did you understand what the reason was? Well, it was built, so it sort of has a magic to it. You know what the other reason was? It's so absolutely sheer and smooth that they can't get their roots into it. Right, so again, remember I told you that this is real sympathetic magic. They can't just do whatever they want. Just like Gandalf can't just burn snow. He's going to have something that burns, and he can make the fire. And so there's just absolutely nothing for them to get their claws, so to speak, their roots in. Absolutely. But, but you know, it is. It's, it is magical in that sense. Uh, so you, you need the key. You can't get in there. And that's it. Uh, you know, it's like, you know, they, they built that beautiful Beelin Tower over here. But there's no way to get to the top and, like, look around. There's, 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 there's a staircase in there. Uh, what, I, I, you, I, do they even wash the windows? I guess they have to bring in a truck or something. There's like no way up there. It's like, come on, folks. Anyway, uh, the, the Beelin, not Beelin Chapel, but Beelin Tower is the one. That, yeah, the roundabout, yeah. It's called Beelin Tower. It's the same family that gave us Beelin Chapel. <laughs> uh, pretty cool. It's, it's beautiful, but it's like, you know. Uh, has anybody gone close enough to see what's written on it? You know what it is? It's all the different titles of Jesus from Colossians 1, you know, first, first fruits, you know, first from the dead. Uh, um, I don't remember all of them. Uh, <laughs> what are they all? <laughs> all the titles of Jesus in Colossians. Uh, it goes all the way around. And somebody made a comment about it that nowhere does it say Jesus is, right? And the only thing is that Beelan's name is on it. So he's like, you know, so Beelan is, the, is all these things. That's not what they're saying, but you can interpret it that way if you're not careful. So it's kind of funny. Anyway, so he says, you will first surrender to me the key of Orthanc and your staff. They, you know, your wizard staff. They shall be pledges of your conduct to be returned later if you merit them. <laughs> Saruman's face grew livid, twisted with rage, and a red light was kindled in his eyes. Talk about rejecting any kind of grace or any kind of thing. The, the anger, the, the true animal within comes out. And that's the thing. We see the evil. He laughed wildly. Later! <laughs> Later! Yes, when you also have the keys of Baradun itself. That's the dark tower, right? I suppose in the crowns of seven kings and the rods of the five wizards and have, put, and have purchased yourself a pair of boots many size larger than these that you wear now. I said, poor Gandalf. Everybody accuses him of wanting everything. Everybody. A modest plan, hardly one in which my help is needed. I have other things to do. Do not be a fool, right? And I will leave now. In other words, go back in the tower. Gandalf says, come back. Whoa. I did not give you... This is like mom just spoke up. Right? I did not give you leave to go, said Gandalf sternly. Someday the kids are going to be bad and Abigail's going to say, stop. And you know, poor Wesley's going to stop too. You're terrified. So... <laughs> <laughs> I did. That's a mother authority, right? I did not give you leave to go. I have not finished. You have become a fool, Saruman, and yet pitiable. Always that pity. The pity that's going to save everything. 
the pity towards Gala. Of course, he's going to save everything in the end. You might, you might still, still have turned away from, from falling in evil and, and have, have been of service. service. You could have not only come offered, but you could have helped in the war against Sauron. Uh, he says, but you, cho- you choose to stay. Not just chose, but choose. Right now, you choose to stay and gnaw the ends of your old uh, The endless bitterness, the resentment, all of it. Um, stay then. But I warn you, you will not easily come out again. Not until the dark hands of the east, that's of course is Sauron, from Mordor, stretch out to take you. Sodomon! He cried and his voice grew in power and authority. Behold, I am not Gandalf the Grey whom you betrayed. I am Gandalf the White who has returned from death. You have no color now and I cast you from the order and from the council. Right? Raise it up. Your staff is broken. In the movie, it's great. Whoosh. You see it's shivering all over the place, right? Um, this is the end. You've become a fool. You've lost everything. Man, this is a great scene. And contrasting with the earlier scene when Saruman basically puts uh, Gandalf in prison. It doesn't make him fly up like in the movie, which is kind of cool. But anyway, he still puts him in prison, right? On the top. On the top of that very same tower, actually, or think. Um, and, 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 and he, he, he all sums, sums it up at, at the very bottom of page 584, very bottom. It says, But he, Saruman, has chosen to withhold it and keep the power of Orthanc. He will not serve, only command. Does anybody know Satan's motto in Paradise Lost? Better to what? Close. You just twitch, twitch around. You're saying it. Better to... Good, better to reign in hell than to serve in heaven. Uh, that's also the motto of what's a character in Star Trek. That's Khan, the wrath of Khan. Okay, you know, you come. Better to reign in hell than to serve in heaven. Very different than Achilles, who said, I would rather be the slave of a slave on the earth than king of all the dead. When does he say that? When does Achilles say that? Nobody else? That's Odyssey 11. That's Odysseus' journey into the underworld in the Odyssey. That's when he meets him. Okay, uh, okay let's move on. Okay, uh, And we are going to meet the Palantir. I want to spend a little, little more time on that before moving on. Uh, just a little bit interesting on page 590. In the middle of the page, the hobbits, Merry and Pippin, are starting to reflect on how Gandalf is different now. Gandalf the White as opposed to Gandalf the Grey. How is he different? And they say, uh, about the middle of the page, Oh, oh, yes, he is, said Mary Boo. He, he has grown, grown or something. He, Gandalf, can be, both, can be both kinder and more alarming, merrier and more solemn than before. Right? He's, he's become uh, something different. Right? They, 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 there's a numinous power to him, like Aslan or something like that. Uh, and he's very, very different. Uh, and, of course, Pippin is getting too curious, isn't he? Too curious. And, and Mary warns him at the very bottom of the page, do, Do not, not meddle, meddle in the affairs of wizards, wizards for, for they are subtle and quick to anger. Okay, Be careful, because they've got the palant here. They don't know what it is yet. Uh, and, and Pippin is kind of lusting to know what it is, right? Uh, we're told, in fact, about two-thirds of the way down page 591, it said that he was driven by some impulse that he did not understand. Pippin feels drawn towards that globe to figure out what it is. He thinks it's a bowling ball, maybe. Bowling ball. Okay. And then on the next page, five, oh wait, page uh, yeah, 592, next page. About the middle of the page, he gets it and it says, Pippin sat with his knees drawn up and the ball between them. He bent low over it, looking like a greedy child stooping over a bowl of food. Did you see him? You know? Little kid. Right? And that image kind of conjures up Gollum as well, you know over and over, pouring over my ashes, okay? Uh, and then he cries out, and then on page 593, the very top, Gandalf gets him, just like in the movie, and he says, come back. What does he mean by that? Come back. Is he afraid? Yeah, we'll say again. 
Look at yourself, because he's losing himself. He's being drawn into, you know, Sauron sucking him in by the palantir, by the seeing stone. It's like, come back, be careful, don't lose yourself. And, 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 and C.S. Lewis uses that phrase a lot, to be careful not to lose yourself. Uh, one critic I read said that, 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 that Gollum loses his self, whereas Frodo, until the very end, tries to lose his ego. Which, which sounds, sounds like the same, same thing, but it's actually very different. Okay, uh, losing, losing our ego is you have to you have to you, you have, have to give, give up everything to gain it. You, 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 you have, have to lose your soul to gain it. Christ says many many different ways about that. Um, so, so don't don't come back, back right? And, and he comes back, back and he talks about uh, what, what he saw. And, and at the very bottom of page five ninety three, again the movie gets all these wonderful lines. He questions him, and then Gandalf says, "All right, say no more. You have taken no harm." There, there is no, no lie in your eyes as I feared, but he, but he did not speak long with you. A fool, but an honest fool, you remain, Peregrine Took. Linton, are you going to find a, a, a way to use that phrase? A fool, but an honest fool? Okay. <laughs> I'm waiting for a cat. Kind of, <laughs> who is it? I know, it's wonderful. He always says that, though. <laughs> yeah, that's great. <laughs> a fool, but an honest one. And again, he didn't take much hurt. And he says here, wiser ones might have done much worse in such a pass. But mark this, you have been saved, and all your friends too, mainly by good fortune. And what does he say? As it is called. Okay? That's just a running refrain, the whole providence thing. Right? Amanda is an expert on providence. That was your first, your first thing, right? As it is called. There's no such thing as luck. That's why some Christians like to say, no, I'm not lucky, I'm blessed. Okay? It's a different way of saying it. It's not just random. Okay, uh, It's a blessing. Of course, you have to be careful, because if you say that to a secular person, then they'll say, oh, so God only cares about you, doesn't care about anybody else? <laughs> the, the cynic will always say that. You know. Um, so, uh, he, he says, be, be careful. And he, I'm sorry, he goes on to say, um, you cannot count on it a second time. If he had questioned you, Sauron, then and there, almost certainly, you would have told all that you know to the ruin of us all. But he was too eager. He did not want information only. He wanted you, quickly, so that he could deal with you in the Dark Tower slowly. Don't shudder. If you will meddle in the affairs of wizards, you must be prepared to think of such things. Don't put your hand in the fire, okay? Or it's going to get burned. Playing with matches, a girl can get burned. Yeah, you got it. Matchmaker from Fiddler on the Roof. Very good. Um, okay. Now, he goes on to explain... Um, uh, yeah, a little bit farther down, he says, I think all will be well now. He was not held long enough, and hobbits have an amazing power of recovery, as children do. The memory or the horror of it will probably fade quickly, too quickly, perhaps. Will you, Aragorn, take the Orfang stone and guard it? It is a dangerous charge. Okay, now, let me read the next line and tell me if this sounds a little bit different than we've heard before. Dangerous, dangerous indeed, but not, not to all. There, there is one who may claim it by right. right. For, For this assuredly is the palantir of Orthanc from the treasury of Elendil, set here by the kings of Gondor. Now my hour draws near, I will take it. That sounds different here. Yeah, more decisive. Right? We saw that, especially leading up uh, to the end of the first book. He still didn't know what to do. But now he's slowly coming into his own. There's a sort of tone of authority here as he's realizing that ultimately this belonged to him. And notice that Gandalf realizes it. Uh, Gandalf looked at Aragorn and then, to the surprise of the others, he lifted the covered stone and bowed as he presented it. Uh, later on in the book, there's a wonderful line, one of my favorite lines, when... Uh, when uh, Gandalf says to Denethor, who's kind of going crazy, he says, for I am also a steward. We'll get to that later. But Gandalf realized that his job is not to rule. That's what happened to Saruman. His job is to be an advisor to the men and the elves and helping them all against Sauron. That's why he was sent. He was not sent to rule, but to be an advisor. A steward, um, and he he should be happy. Right? I mean, the the a steward should be the most happy when the king actually arrives. Right? A good parent is happy when their child really becomes an adult. Right? Of course, we're all going to have the temptation to hold on, let let them go. Right? But we're supposed to be happy. Right? And let them go. Um, and here again, he doesn't just give it to him; he actually bows. Receive it, Lord. 
in earnest of other things that shall be given back. But if I may counsel you in the use of your own, do not use it yet. Be wary. And this is like almost the only time in the book. When have I been hasty or unwary who have waited and prepared for so many long years, said Aragorn? He's, he's, he's like a little sauce there. He's like, he's coming into his own. He's answering back. And he's right. I mean, he's, he's pretty, pretty careful. And G Gandalf backs off. Never yet. Do not then stumble at the end of the road. But at the least, keep this thing secret. He likes to tell people to keep things secret. And safe, right? Keep it hidden. Keep it secret. Keep it safe. You and all the others that stand here, the hobbit, peregrine above all, should not know where it is bestowed. The evil fit may come on him again. Okay? For alas, he is handled. So we've got to be careful. We're going to move on. Okay? Uh, the hour is coming. Uh, where in the Bible do we hear that phrase? The hour is coming. The hour has not yet come. Good, and that's up. And particularly in the Gospel of John, Jesus often says it. Uh, and sometimes it's translated, my time has not yet come, but literally in Greek it's my hour has not yet come. Right? I'm, I'm not ready. Right? My hour, even to his mother who wants him to do the, the miracle of King of Galilee. My hour has not yet come. Well, actually, all right, do what she says. It's mom. Okay, do what she says. The, um, so, so um, uh, again, because Aragorn is the messianic king, he is definitely the messianic king. All right, then, uh, then, then they go off, and we have so much fun, uh, starting on page 597, where we have a wonderful question and answer session between uh, Pippin and Gandalf, right? Uh, and we get to see that little poem on the top of 597. Uh, tall ships and tall kings, three times three. What brought they from the foundered land over the flowing sea? Seven stars and seven stones and one white tree. You know what it means by the foundered land? Who escaped from what with the seven stars and seven stones? Good, that's right. So the, those are the ones that were called the faithful, as opposed to the king's men. The faithful, which included Elendil and his two sons, and Arian and Isildur. Uh, they escaped, and they came, uh, and eventually the Middle Earth, because remember, Balerion was also sunk uh, by that same wave. And they brought over those things, that white tree, um, and that's a link. And we also find out later that the Palantir uh, was probably created by Feanor, the same guy who made the Silmarils. Uh, and we get more information here. Uh, but just one, one line that I want to point out on page 597, about two-thirds of the way down. Uh, there is nothing that Sauron cannot turn to evil uses, right, because the Palantir were, were good. But he corrupted him. It says, Alas for Saruman, it was his downfall, as I now perceive, perilous to us all are the devices of an art deeper than we possess ourselves. Remember that is just a sort of good rule of thumb. Okay? Perilous to us all are the devices of an art deeper than we possess ourselves. Now this is not uh, what they call obscurantism. If God meant man to fly, he would have given him wings. We're not talking about that. Like we, we can grow and learn and even, I mean, Tolkien wasn't against all you know, he he did actually have a car at one point. He got rid of it. He had a car later. And do you know what he what you know what what he was willing to use that Lewis didn't? What's this? What kind of a pen? It's a ballpoint pen. Okay. Lewis continued to write with an ink dip pen. Not unbelievable. But Tolkien actually got himself a pen, real pens, and he also got himself a typewriter, which Lewis never used. So he wasn't completely against all technology, right, but he didn't like the misuse of it. Um, good? Oh, good. You dig it? Yeah, good. There's a magic deeper still that she did not know. Right? The knowledge only goes back to the dawn of time. And it, that's great. <laughs> we'll be teaching Darnie again in the fall. We'll get some of the folks. You both are graduating, right? Abigail, you're both graduating, yeah. No, that's just for the undergrads. Yeah, that's, that's the undergrad class. Yeah, you come sit in. You know, I don't know if it'll be in this room or not. We'll see. But it'll be Mondays from 4 to 6.30. The, uh, what's it? Oh, that's right, of course. <laughs> anyway, uh, but, but look at now. I, I love this part. I wonder, I wonder if any of you uh, kind of identify with Pippin here. The very bottom of 598. It says, well, what did the men of old use them for, asked Pippin. And I love this. It says, delighted and astonished at getting answers to so many questions and wondering how long it would last. 
And again, there's something so childlike about Pippin and Mary, even though they're very brave and all that. It's just, what is, oh, come on, keep asking, keep asking, keep asking. We got him on, we got him on a roll. That's how I feel about my little baby nephew. Oh, yeah? He enjoyed entertaining all of his white hands. You never know when he's going to realize that I'm not mommy. Oh, oh that's right, then turn around. Yeah, see? It's like, let's, 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 let's go with it right now. I'm getting answers. You don't get answers from get. Yeah, uh, it, it, what, is, what is it? When he comes back as Gandalf the White, it was a gimbal that says, in one thing, or no, it's Lego. In one thing, you have not changed, my friend. You still speak in riddles. I think it's Lego loss. It says in the movie, um, you still speak in riddles. <laughs> uh, anyway, he goes on and, and talks a lot of the stuff we've already talked about, where those seven stones uh, got distributed and things like that, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, but then, if you get down to the bottom of page five ninety nine, this is I'm sorry, five ninety eight. Bottom of five ninety eight. Uh, this is a line that could come right out of Narnia. Let's see if you understand what I'm saying here, Ellie. Okay, uh, after he, he gives a long paragraph where he describes everything, then Pippin says, I wish I had known all this before. I had no notion of what I was doing. Oh, yes, you had. <laughs> you knew you were behaving wrongly and foolishly, and you told yourself so, though you did not listen. Those of you that have read Narnia and want to talk about it, one of the things that happens in Narnia is Aslan, he forgives the children when they repent, but he doesn't let them go until they understand what they did wrong and understand that they could have resisted it, but they didn't. He always, I call them these little catechisms where he, he makes them understand that you didn't have to do this, okay? You knew what you were doing. Oh, yes, you did, Pippin. You knew, you didn't know everything, but you knew what you were doing was wrong, right? And again, very, both Lewis and Tolkien, this, this is the idea of virtue and understanding that we are, you know, morally self-regulating beings. We have to make choice. We have to choose virtue and not choose vice. Uh, and he goes on to explain, I did not tell you all this before because it is only by musing on all that has happened that I have at last understood even as we ride together. But if I had spoken sooner, it would not have lessened your desire or made it easier to resist. On the contrary, no, the burned hand teaches best. Unfortunately, we end up learning the burned hand way. Well, anyways. Wait, was this your mom or your mother-in-law? It's actually your mother-in-law. Okay, that's right. That's good. <laughs> and she said, you actually, have you actually have some of my books or you heard, heard me on the radio? You have some books. Oh, that's right. Okay. Good stuff. Good stuff. Um, okay. Um, oh, and then finally, Gandalf runs out of uh, patience. And I love this. He says to him, Mercy, cried Gandalf, top of 599. If the giving of information is to be the cure of your inquisitiveness, I shall spend all the rest of my days in answering you. What more do you want to know? And Pippin's got the best answer if anybody asks you that question. Why? The names of all the stars and of all living things and the whole history of Middle Earth and over heaven and of the sundering seas? Of course. What less? But I am not in a hurry tonight. <laughs> I want to know everything that there is. And that's the wonderful thing about the uh, hobbits, right, who will sit on the edge of doom and discuss all of these things, right? Who will, who will in the midst of, of you know, great danger, sit down and have a dinner, right? Maybe thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies, the 23rd Psalm. Maybe Tolkien had that in mind. Okay, are we ready to uh, uh, actually move into book three and four, four and find out what's been happening to... Frodo and Sam, because we haven't heard anything from them. What's that? Oh, as your favorite line. Which was your favorite chapter? Oh, Rider's Row. Oh, yeah, that's great. Okay, that's great. Um, I just love it. <laughs> you probably are going to also enjoy when the hobbits meet um, Faramir, because there's a lot of posturing there too, which is really fun. Yeah, I just love that. <laughs> Okay, uh, I'm going to jump in here. This, this, you know, this, these first chapters are actually pretty slow, so we can actually move ahead a little bit. Uh, the first time we actually meet Gollum is on page 613. Top of page 613. As he comes down, right? And the first time we see him, he's climbing down the side of the wall like a little spider. And if, you, if, you, if you're familiar with uh, Dracula, the original Dracula, we, we see him crawling down the wall almost spider-like. Um, so it says, down the face of a precipice, sheer and almost smooth it seemed in the pale moonlight, a small black shape was moving with its thin limbs splayed out. 
Maybe its soft clinging hands and toes were finding crevices and holes that no hobbit could ever have seen or used, but it looked as if it was just creepier, creeping down on sticky pads, like some large prowling thing of insect kind. And of course we'll find out that he's working with Shilab, okay? The evil spider, really a Maiar in spider form, or at least an evil spirit in spider form. It's hard to tell if Shilab is still a Maiar, because she's really finally an offspring of Ungolian, so maybe she's a lesser Maya, or we don't know, but she, she is not a spider. She's in spider form. Just, just, just the Balrogs are in the form of fire demons, but they really are more like angels, spiritual beings. Right? Uh, so he comes down bit by bit by bit, you know, when we first started hearing that, 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 that the language, and it's just, Tolkien is so brilliant. He just gave this way of speaking like hobbits is. Where did that come from? I mean, but it's so um, unique to Gollum. I mean, you, you immediately recognize him, the kind of things he says and whatnot. And we get, just like in the movie, this is Sting, Gollum. Do you remember this blade? Okay, move and I'll cut your throat. Okay, but then, almost like it's a movie, he hears in his background um, uh, Gandalf saying, right, it was pity that stayed his hand. Right? And he doesn't give in. He saves him. But... How can we trust this person? Well, I want to make sure we understand. On the bottom of page 617, at first they tie him up with the rope. And what does he say about the rope? It's the very bottom of 617. It hurts us! It hurts us! It freezes! It bites! Elves twisted and cursed them! Nasty, cruel hobbits! That's why we tried to escape, of course. It is precious. We guess they were cruel hobbits. Okay, now, why does the rope cause him so much pain? It's elvish, okay? Uh, can you make a connection here to, to vampire legends? Oh, good. And, and actually, he so much hates light that he not only hates the sun, he even hates the what? And what does he call them? Do you understand? The, the sun is the yellow face, and the moon is the white face. He waits for the stars to come in, or the moon to set, because even that light bothers him. And notice that because the elves are the closest to the sacred people. They're, not, they're really not angels, but they're like that. And a vampire is hurt by anything that is sacred or blessed. So what are some of the things that hurts a vampire other than light? Good. Holy water. You, you throw, you know, uh, in, in that crazy movie Van Halen, don't they have like, like bullets made out of holy water? You know, it's great stuff. But anything, holy water. That housing, what did I just... Oh, I said Van Halen. <laughs> That's so funny. <laughs> yeah, that was a, that band is when I was a kid. Thank you, Halen. <laughs> oh man, that's old. I'm surprised you even heard of that. Are they still around? That was when I was a kid. It was a long time ago. That's so funny. Thank you, Van Helsing. <laughs> what the heck did he say? Oh, did he? Oh, did he die recently? Eddie. Okay. Maybe. Yeah, that was when I was a kid. Oh my gosh. Bon Jovi, who's actually from New Jersey, I believe, which is where I grew up. Bruce Springsteen is from Jersey, too, yeah. Bruce Springsteen, yeah. He's still going strong. Yeah. Some of his songs are really Christian-like when you listen to them. He's an odd fish. Uh, but there's some of his songs that are talk about redemption and things. He's still alive? Huh. Still alive? Oh my gosh, wow. Huh. He's one of the many famous rock stars who really can't sing, but he does anyway. He tells a story. I tell you who's got the worst voice of all is that, what's that guy, the, the times they are a changing guy? Uh, you know, famous one. You know, blowing in the wind? Oh, man. I just forget his name. Uh, oh, you know, you know that guy. What's his name? What's it? Oh my gosh, how can I forget his name? It'll come to me in a second. He just won, he just won like the Pulitzer Prize for his songs. Uh, oh my gosh, how can I forget his name? Anyway, it'll, it'll come to me. Anyway. That, that's weird. I can't remember anything today. It's, it's the mask, cuts off the blood supply. Anyway, didn't I tell you I saw a, a meme where the meme said, okay, here is a picture before COVID and then during COVID. Bob Dylan, thank you. I just couldn't remember his name for some reason. Bob Dylan. He can't sing to save his life, but maybe you listen to it. But anyway. Uh, heck, jo Johnny Cash? 
has a range of about five notes. I've never seen him move out of a five note range. I mean, he's a cool guy. Oh, that ring of fire. <laughs> Get him, get him, get him. I don't even know if he can do a lot to that boy. Anyway, but the, um, but then, so, and then the, the last one was after COVID, and it was this. <laughs> the guy's ears were like, I just love that. We're all going to look like that. Okay. By the way, France just went on another lockdown. Did you hear that? Anyway. Okay, so we won't go on any tangents here. So, anyway, uh, okay, so what else? So, so holy water, do you know what else hurts Dracula? If you put this on his head, it'll put a, a, a hole in his head. That literally will burn his head. That's it? They throw the cross too, and then something else will put a circular hole. What, what, what looks like little circle? What looks like Lembus? What is Lembus? In the allegorically. The Eucharist. Okay, we know what they call it. You know what the Catholics call it. They call it, they call it the host. Okay, and in, and in some versions of Dracula, if you have the host, that's the it, it, when if you go to Catholic mass, the the, the 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 bread is like a kind of a circular wafer, uh, and if you press that against him, it'll like burn burn his head. You'll see that in different versions. Like I said, holy water, the cross, uh, and again anything that's been, including you cannot a vampire cannot enter your home unless you invite him in. Once, Once you invite him in, he can come and go. You know why? <laughs> okay, until very recently, and maybe still uh, with Catholics, I mean, when you buy a home, you'll bring a priest over to do what? Bless the home. And what they'll bless is the threshold, partly. But then you stick, like carrying over the, the wife over, is your husband carrying over the threshold? Oh, there was a... Okay. The, um... So, so you, you got yourself a pretty good daughter-in-law there, by the way. Yeah, yeah. Like yeah you'll, you'll keep her. You'll keep her. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway. She's the one that did the whole Narnia wedding. Oh! Oh, you did? Did you have Narnia? Did you have music from Narnia? Yeah, I walked out to the battle song. The battle song? <laughs> <laughs> I told my daughter she might walk down the aisle too. You know, that uh, da da dee da da you know that or da 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 Oh my God! <laughs> da, da, da. That's pretty creative. That's that's pretty cool. Oh, that's great. Have a together, get an idea here. That's pretty wild. Oh, they won't let you move around. What, 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 one, one of our one of my colleagues a long time ago got married, and she and her husband were both Aggies. And, and they, they wanted the Aggie, Aggie hymn, but, but they wouldn't let him because it was like Methodist or something. But the groom's cake, did you have a groom cake? Yeah. yeah. That's more of a southern thing. I don't remember that up north. We have the, 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 the bride's cake and the groom's cake is usually chocolate. And his groom's cake was the Aggie football field. This is pretty cool. Yeah, those are Aggies. Yeah, the stadium, in other words. Yeah. With all the lines and everything. It was pretty cool looking. Well, well, it was the field. I mean, they, they didn't have briefs or something, but it was the, the field with all the lights. But anyway, um, but that would, that would be pretty cool, you know. So the threshold has been blessed, and so you can't go. Uh, also, a lot of times vampires can't cross running water, which is kind of suggestive of baptism. And in the movie, it's not in the book, but in the movie, remember the way the hobbits escape in the beginning is they jump in the ferry, a buckleberry, whatever, and they go out and, and uh, they can't cross. Of course, then later on at the, the Fords of Bruin, and they, although they gingerly try to cross, but, but, but still, I mean, it, that, even though that wasn't in the book, that kind of fits with the idea of, and, you know, again, so he is, he's not literally a vampire, but, and, and, and remember when he tries to eat the, the lembus, ah, dust and ashes, he says, right? It hurts. it hurts us again. Again, it, it, it would be like him. It would be like him trying to take communion, basically. Um, so th th this, this is you know, it's consistent throughout. Uh, and and it's the same thing with the, the Black Riders. They also are in a way allergic to holy things, if you would say. Right. Um, so finally, well, well, what can you, what can you swear on that we can believe you? Well, can you swear on? We'll swear on the precious, on the precious. So page six eighteen towards the top. Smeagol will swear on the precious. On the precious? How dare you? Think, would you commit your promise to that, Smeagol? It will hold you, but it is more treacherous than you are. By the way, there are certain times, even though I think Elijah Wood did a good job on the whole, 
There are certain lines that's like you really can't imagine him saying it, just because the real um, the real Frodo of the book is like fifty years old. He's not young. Now Sam is younger. Sam was like thirty-five. Sam, by the way, is the same age as Faramir. They're both about thirty-five, but Frodo is older. And so, like I said, I, the, 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 you know, he says something like this, but I can't imagine Elijah Wood saying this exact speech because it, it does sound like somebody a little bit older. Um, it will hold you, but it is more treacherous than you are. It may twist your word. That's why you really do need to get the uh, BBC 13-hour uh, um, uh, uh, radio play version, and you'll get a little bit different feel for Frodo, who's played by Ian Holt, the guy who plays Bilbo in the movie. Uh, and... You'll, You'll also get, I, I thought, of course, Vigo did a great job, but um, if you listen to Aragorn in the radio play, he's got a much gruffer voice. It's a little bit different. Uh, and the, the two complement each other. Um, anyway, so he says, Gollum, on the precious, on the precious, and what would you swear? To be very, very good. Smeagol will swear never, never to let him have it. Never. That's not what you're supposed to be swearing, but anyway. Never. Smeagol will save it, but he must swear on the precious. No, not on it. All you wish is to see it and touch it, if you can, though you know it would drive you mad. Didn't uh, Frodo already see somebody try to touch the precious and it had an effect on him? Yeah, when Bilbo... Okay. The, um, <laughs> he says, Not on it, swear by it, if you will, for you know where it is. Yes, you know, Smeagol, it is before you. And then I love this. For a moment it appeared to Sam. You see how he, do, you, do, you, do you like this, uh, Clinton, you pay attention to these details? You know, in terms of writing, suddenly it's like we move back and we suddenly get the perspective from Sam watching it. But we've been really close, and now suddenly it changes. And, and from Sam's point of view, it appeared to Sam that his master Frodo had grown and Gollum had shrunk. A tall, stern shadow, a mighty lord who hid his brightness in gray cloud, and at his feet a little whining dog. Yet the two were in some way akin and not alien. Remember how upset Frodo got when he heard that Gollum was basically a hobbit? No, that's not possible, right? Well, why do you think that Bilbo and, and Smeagol both understood the riddle game and the rules and all that? Right? So we have to be careful. Uh, it says, uh, where is it? Um, uh, they could reach one another's minds. Gollum raised himself and began pawing at Frodo, fawning at his knees. Down, down, now speak your promise. We promise this. Yes, I promise. I will serve the master of the precious. What did he just do? Almost never does this in the novel. He, he says, I. He's always saying we, but now we know this is serious. There's I, and the I ultimately has got to be Smeagol. Right? I... Um, I promise I will serve the master of the precious. Good master, good Smeagol. Take the rope off, Sam. Reluctantly, Sam obeyed. At once, Gollum got up and began prancing about like a whipped cur whose master has patted it. From that moment, a change, which lasted for some time, came over him. He spoke with less hissing and whining, and he spoke to his companions directly, not to his precious self. He would cringe and flinch if they stepped near him or made any sudden movement, and he avoided the touch of their elven cloaks. But he was friendly, and indeed pitifully anxious to please. He would cackle with laughter and caper if any jest was made, or even if Frodo spoke kindly to him, and weep if Frodo rebuked him. So again, there's a moment, you know, we've just seen Sauron, or Saruman, have a redemptive moment that he refuses. Well, Gollum here, there's a chance. And part of it is because he is obeying the master. You know, again, for both Tolkien and Lewis, there's, there's a good kind of hierarchy. There's a bad kind of hierarchy that oppresses, but there's also a good kind of hierarchy, an ordering uh, of, of, of things. Uh, and it actually brings out a little bit more of Gollum's humanity, or his hobbitanity, <laughs> whatever. Um, but anyway, very, very interesting. Smeagol, Smeagol. Uh, and the next chapter, just notice, I'm going to go, but, but we, we get to hear uh, uh, um, Gollum sing songs. Everybody sings their own songs in this thing, right? Everybody turns to song at one point or another. It's wonderful. I'm going to move a little bit farther. Uh, then, it just, it's on page 622 where he tries to eat the, uh, the, uh, the, the whey bread, the lembas, and again, he calls it dust and ashes. He can't. And, and look what Frodo says about him. And this is uh, page 622, just before that space break. It says, I'm sorry, said Frodo, but I can't help you. I'm afraid. I think this food would do you good if you would try. 
but perhaps you can't even try. Not yet, anyway. Is he beyond redemption? Is there any hope for him? There's one moment, and actually, uh, um, uh, Amanda, you talked about it in your thing. There is one moment when Gollum almost becomes you know, good again, but he comes back to it every time. It's sad. Okay, they're going through the passage of the marshes, the tricksy lights, the tricksy lights. Now, starting with the marshes, and then eventually when we get into Mordor, Tolkien really spends a lot of time describing these landscapes, okay? That are dust and ashes and choked out and starved and decaying. What, what do you think are some of the influences that may have influenced Tolkien's image of these places? First of the marshes, but then later on where there's no water at all. And it's just arid and burning and all. What, can you think of some? First of all, what's the historical one? That he, Okay, wait, the no man's land. During World War One, when they had the trench warfare, in between was no man's land where there were just bodies decay. Have any, have any of you seen 1917 yet? Okay, so that will really give you a powerful image of that. There are other movies as well. Okay. Um, but what about other things from um, from uh, from literature? Uh, something maybe that T. S. Eliot wrote? Okay. The wasteland. Okay. It's a place without water. It's a place without real growth or life. And the wasteland is certainly there in the background. Would you think another one? Yeah, very good. I was going to try. I was going to try to pull that, but you got it. Okay. Uh, what, what do we? What, what is that called? The land. The, the big billboard. Yeah, remember? And they call it the land of ashes, or something. Exactly. There's yeah, something like that. Where, where, but, but it's where you get the big, which seem to be the eyes of God watching you. But it, we can think of the eyes of Sauron. But yes, they call it the land of ashes, all choked out and stuff like that. I think he certainly had that in mind, right? Uh, what about in uh, Arthurian lore? Do you know of a character uh, who, who, who sort of becomes sick and in some cases impotent, and as he gets you know older and decrepit, the land dies around him? You know who he's called? It's called the something something. The something king. You heard the phrase the Fisher King? Okay. There's a lot of stories. And, uh, the, the, the Wagner opera called Parsifal, which is the same name as Percival. Uh, Parsifal is, is it, it's tied sometimes to the Holy Grail legend as well. And again, as he decays, the whole land around him decays and the sort of evil sympathy with him. So there's, there's lots of these kinds of images uh, in literature. You might even think of The Heart of Darkness by Joseph Conrad as a little bit of that. But uh, it's just almost at the intersection of so many of these modern wastelands. And like I said, particularly uh, The Wasteland by Eliot. Oh, it's called Parsifal. And it's about Percival uh, going for the Holy Grail. And it's the one that he wrote towards the end, and it's one of the ones that made Nietzsche turn against him. Because Wagner used some really powerful Christian imagery in Parsifal, because it's, it's a Christian story. And that's one of the reasons Wagner turned against him. He was started as a disciple of him, not literally, but as, as you know, kind of worshipping him, they turned against him and stuff like that. Uh, that often happens with crazy geniuses. You know, they, they like people and they turn against him with anger. Uh, Freud hated everybody by the end. You know, they, they were all wrong. They were all wrong. They were all wrong. They were but the uh, but anyway, it, it, it's it's this stuff, and then again, that just I mean, just imagine being in no man's land when it starts to rain. I mean, you don't understand, you know, those people, those soldiers living in the trenches. I mean, were, there were literally lice all over them, rats, you know, swimming. I mean, it's unbelievable uh, what, what they put up with and all the diseases and stuff like that. But here it is now. If if you if this is the first time you read it, you might have been shocked that something does not happen here that happens in the movie. That's really dramatic. Do you remember what happens in the movie during the passage of the marshes, the dead marshes? Yeah, Frodo falls in, and they almost grab him, which can't happen there, because here they're so far down, you can't actually reach them. Uh, eerie and stuff. Uh, and what's really important in the movie is that not only does Frodo fall in, what happens, remember? Who's saying? Gollum saves him. Now, that doesn't actually happen, although Gollum still is saving them in the sense that they would not have survived this. Uh, but the movie just wants to make it a little stronger, and it, and it works. But the, the movie follows that eerie. That, and, and notice Tolkien says it's, like, it's almost like they have candles, but he never explains why. These are the people that died at the Battle of Dagorland. That that's the battle that just led up to the place where they actually attacked the Dark Tower and Isildur cut the ring off of Sauron's hand. Just before that, and I think we said it before, but Dagorlad is 
the, 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 the last time the elves and men came together to fight together. And it's the time when a group of men swore to Isildur they would fight, but they did not come, and that's why they were cursed, and that will be the paths of the dead that we'll get to a couple weeks down the road. Um, but that, that's what it was. And, and, and so this battle is like 3,000 years ago, right? And it's just this eerie, this place, this place of death. Hmm, I, I don't know. It just, it, it's just one of those things that gets you at a deep level. You just feel. Yeah. I don't, definitely won't leave other place. That's pretty much what HBU looks like when we have a storm. That's what the girls' dorm looks like when there's a storm, you know, surrounded by a boat, you know. Uh, no, the, uh, to flood. Oh, the Mercy's worse, okay. You know, one, you know, one understands when people like Houstonians are not ready for the freeze we had a month ago, because that happens like once every hundred years. But HBU should really be prepared for something that happens like every month. I mean, it's, it's unbelievable. <laughs> so, I said, I love this school, but I curse the school twice a day as I'm walking through the mud to get here. I hate to do it, but it's just, why? Why? I don't know. I don't go there. But like I said, and like I said, you can, I can drive my car over the stones, but I'm not going to destroy my... I think I almost destroy my shoes walking over those stones. I'm not going to take my tires over it. Oh. Oh, yes. That's right. <laughs> Oh, I see. Makes the donors happy too. Right. That's true. Right. Oh, that makes sense. We'll, we'll ignore the like we'll ignore the black mold in the showers and all that stuff. Yeah, right. If you want to keep the school in good shape and be bringing in more students, you don't need a new building. You need to have better buildings. I know. Better buildings to live in. To live in, I know. It's true. Every every building except the big one. The Hodo's still in pretty good shape, I guess. Is the nest a little better? That's newer, although not like 15 years. That's fine. But the other one. Oh, yeah, yeah, just crumbling. Oh, oh, yeah, yeah, oh, boy. Atwood 1. I don't know how that survived, uh, that Harvey, the one before it. Um. Oh. Oh, oh, what they wanted, yeah. Yeah, once it's done, we'll see if they can cover all of it, but you're right, yeah. No, what's that? Let's see, I'm going to skip a bit here. Okay, let's go to chapter 3, which starts on page 636. And I won't read it to you, but we get the wonderful description of the, uh, the, the Black Gate, Moranin, the, the, the teeth of Mordor. Right? And remember that that huge gate, which they really go overboard in the movie, man, that's amazing. Um, uh, that was built by the Numenorians too. Most of the stuff was built by the Numenorians. It was supposed to be, you know, a, a, a perpetual watch to keep, you know, keep it safe, but they, they, they stop being vigilant. And the bad guys come in and they take over the gate and they use it and things like that. Just like Saruman took over Orthanc because they ceased to watch. They ceased to be careful. Be vigilant. Be prepared. 
Um, that's not only the motto of the Boy Scouts, but be prepared is sort of the motto of, you know, some of Jesus and what they call this Olivet Discourse about the end of the, of the world. Be prepared, be ready. You don't know when the thief will come in the middle of the night, okay? Be prepared, be prepared. Uh, don't, don't make sure you bring enough oil, lest you be like what? Yeah, remember the foolish virgins? The, fool, the wise virgins brought extra oil, the foolish virgins did not, it ran out. They said to the wise virgin, give us some, no, ours, but go, go, go buy some. And they went to buy, but when they came back, the bridegroom had come and the gates were shut. And they couldn't get in to the wedding party. Right? So, uh, you know, that, that theme kind of uh, goes, but uh, anyway, this was supposed to be the end, right? They, they had only asked Gollum to take them to the black gate. But then Gollum says, no, 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 you, you can't go in there. It's impossible. You, you can't. And this is a nice scene in the movie where they fall down and, and, and they're, they're covered by their, their cloaks and, and they sort of blend in with the gravel or whatever it's supposed to be. Um, but, yeah, that, that was wild. <laughs> they, they went down there. They, you know what they should have done? Not have some guards, dress themselves as the guards and then said, oh, we, oh, oh. oh. It's the sort of Wizard of Oz for a second. But anyway, the... Um, <laughs> but on page uh, uh, page 637 at the bottom he said no no don't, don't do it don't do it Gollum says uh, very bottom paragraph no no master no 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 use that way no use don't take the precious to him he'll eat us all I love that, that image he devours what, what's that okay I know it's a weird way to put it but you know again the evil one does devour us he'll eat us all if he gets it eat all the world Keep, and, and by the way, uh, if you know C.S. Lewis's book, The Screwtape Letters, what does he imagine the devil's doing to our souls? They're feeding on them. I think they'll give a bit of you to me now. Okay. Anyway, he says, uh, keep it nice, Master, and be kind to Smeagol. Don't let him have it, or go away, go to nice places, and give it back to little Smeagol. Yes, yes, Master, give it back, eh? Smeagol will keep it safe. He will do lots of good, especially the nice hobbits. Hobbits, go home. Don't go to the gate. Now, did you catch what Gollum just said? Give it back to me. No, you know, he just slipped it in there? Slipped it in there? I, yeah, I remember in the past, you know, students, like, we're, we're talking about the test, and we're talking back and forth, and one student will be like, and the essay you're going to ask us is? And they think they're going to catch me, like I want to just say it. And you always get a few students that try that. It was kind of funny. <laughs> you tried it, you know. Anyway. Oh, the professor doesn't even know. That's right, yeah. I said, I know. Oh, my gosh. It's hysterical. The, uh, okay, uh, by the way, apparently, finally, Dr. Hertenberg is passing out my book. A free copy of my book for the Honors College students. It was donated. Anyway. Yeah, this was something for the, 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 my book, um, Ancient Voices, Classical Greece. And it's dedicated to Dr. Morris, and he bought, like, 150 copies to give out to the Honors College. And Dr. Hertenberg hasn't done it yet. It's like, ooh. So hopefully he's doing it now. But anyway, <laughs> it's there if you go to the, uh, what is it called, the, the suite. But anyway, um, then, okay, then we have that, that um, okay, that, then we have that moment that, that's in the, in the film, uh, you know, starting, I won't read it, but 638, we start to get that little inner dialogue between Gollum and Smeagol. And it's kind of interesting because here, Sam overhears it. In the movie, only we see the first of them. Right? But, but again, again, back, and, and you'll, you'll notice that, that um, you, know, you know, again, he's, he's, he's going, going back and forth, forth talking to himself and stuff like that. Uh, um, and, and then, then uh, okay, sorry, I just lost it. Okay. Uh, um, uh, uh, I've lost my place. I'm sorry. Okay. Uh, go to page 640, because this is where, uh, this is where Frodo picks up on the, uh, on that little slip, that little, uh, what I want, revealing slip of the tongue. Okay. Uh, <laughs> it's like, I'm, I'm told that, so I watched on the news where, where Biden slipped up and said President Harris. <laughs> he said that. Of course, the, the Republicans made a lot of that. It's pretty funny. Anyway, he says, okay, so page 640, about the middle paragraph, it says, uh, I did not mean the danger that we all share, said Frodo. I mean a danger to yourself alone. You, Gollum, you swore a promise by what you call the precious. Remember that. I will hold you to it, but it will seek a way to twist it to your own undoing. Already you are being twisted. You revealed yourself to me just now foolishly. Give it back to Smeagol, you said. Do not say that again. 
we we see the tougher side of Frodo. Do, do not, not let, let that, that thought grow, grow in you. You, you will, will never, never get it back. back. But the, the desire, desire of it may betray you to a bitter end. You will, will never, never get it back. In the last need, Smeagol, I should put on the precious and the precious mastered you long ago. If I, wearing it, were to command you, you would obey, even if it were to leap from a precipice or to cast yourself into the fire. Most people that read it kind of miss that. Why do I say that's important, that line? That's what's going to happen after he bites off the ring. So did he? Did he cast himself? Was it the ring? Was it his prime? They never, Tolkien never says. But we, we want to see this line that suggests... It, you know, if you do something wrong, it will betray you. And that's literally what happens. He gets cast into the fire. Um, again, we never find that he slipped, it was a kind of suicide thing, whatever, but it's certainly linked to this. He said, and such would be my command. So have a care, Smeagol. Then we pull back again and get Sam's perspective. Sam looked at his master with approval, but also with surprise. There was a look in his face and a tone in his voice, Frodo's, that, that, sorry, lost my place. That, that he had not, not known, known that Sam had not known before. And it had always been a notion of Sam's that the kindness of dear Mr. Frodo was of such a high degree that it must imply a fair measure of blindness. Of course, he also firmly held the incompatible belief that Mr. Frodo was the wisest person in the world, with the possible exception of old Mr. Bilbo and Gandalf. Gollum, in his own way, and with much more excuse as his acquaintance was much briefer, may have made a similar mistake confusing kindness and blindness. At any rate, this speech abashed and terrified him. Gollum. Gollum groveled on the ground and could speak no clear words, but nice last time. Now this is, again, incredibly... Um, what's the word I want? It, it, his understanding, again, of, of the way the human mind works, okay? Because I want you to think of... Frodo as whatever, the professor, and Sam as just like a regular guy, a farmer, a gardener, okay? And sometimes the regular people, the ones that went to the school of hard knocks, they look at the more educated people and think, well, not, not you're a jerk, they still like them, but they think they're a little bit what? Exactly, naive. And this, this is true. I mean, like I, said, I know a little better because I, you know, I worked at my father's gas station. I'm not going to be able to see different things like that. And sometimes they, they may even respect him, but they're like, you're a little bit naive. You're a little absent-minded professor. You're too trusting, okay? And the, the two of them go together, okay? Uh, can somebody tell me the most famous pairing of an idealist master and his more realistic servant? Some consider this the first novel ever written. You've read it. I know you've read it, Abigail. Well, what if I told you it's a knight and a squire? <laughs> Who's the most famous knight and his squire? The knight's very idealistic, tries to right every wrong and makes a fool out of himself. And his famous servant, who's just kind of a peasant guy, is always having to get his master out of disaster, like when he goes after things thinking that they're dangerous and they're not really. Hey, Don Quixote and Sancho Panza. Okay? So there's certainly in the, in the background. And later on, when they meet Faramir, he will basically say, this is someone in my service. He talks almost like a knight and a squire. Okay? And again, he is the more idealistic one, Don Quixote, right? And Sancho, you know, he's very, very loyal and he follows him, but he's always got to get him out of skin because this poor guy is up. Now, if you've ever read the whole thing, Don Quixote Part 2, something weird happens at the end and they sort of flip-flop. And suddenly Sancho becomes more idea of what's to keep going and, and Don Quixote is, I'm done with this. It's kind of a strange inversion that happens at the end of the, of the full two-part novel. Um, and, uh, did you wait, have you taken some Spanish classes? No. You haven't taken Spanish, okay. The, uh, you know Spanish? Just a little bit, much. It's kind of cool to read. Well, of course, Don Quixote is exactly the same time as Shakespeare, so it's an older kind of Spanish. Uh, but we can understand it, like we can understand Shakespeare, but it is older. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Oh, that's neat. Wow. That's Dr. Estrada's favorite. He's read Don Quixote again and again and again. And then one time he read, he taught it in in English. 
for, for the, the MLA. It was so, so strange. The first time he ever taught in English, he was taught Spanish. But anyway, the but again, this is just very. Uh, it shows a real understanding that again, and you should, it's exactly the right word. He thinks he's naive. But, but he, he isn't so naive, right? right? Don't, Don't mix kindness with blindness, blindness okay? okay? He, he might be kind and patient, and patient, but that does not mean he's a pushover. What is, what is the difference, preacher, between, between weakness, weakness and meekness? Okay. Having the ability to do great harm but Oh, good. That's a good way to put it. That's a good way to put it. And and again, you might think of that meek. The meek shall inherit the earth, right? And, and, and Christ tells us to be meek. But meek is not the same thing as weak. You're right. It is good. You you, you I mean you 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 restrain it. And and of course we see a kind of meekness like that in Gandalf and Aragorn at parts until they come forward. It's very very important. There's a difference between the two. But we do have this idea that that person is weak, uh, but they're not. Right? There, there's a strength there, and it, it's like a kind of a revelation to Sam. It's like, oh, wait a minute! Wow, I didn't know he was that strong and could be that what word to use. Not mean, but that firm. I guess. Right? Don't, don't, you know, be careful. Beware the patience. Beware the fury of a patient man. <laughs> right? uh, and then, you know, we're always getting, like I said, you, you know, a lot of the stuff. You know, he's always mixing in the backstory and the different towers and. What's what and all that sort of stuff. It's very important. Um, and then he tells him, I'm going to take you by the long way around. Right? I'm going to take you and show you. You know, they, They're just going to go down and they're going to get to, because like I said, remember there's, uh, there's the river undoing. Right? In the middle of the river is Asgiliath. Right? On this side of the river is Minas Tirith, right? the Tower of Guard. And on this side is Minas Morgul, right? The power of black magic, right? But right to the side of this great tower that's owned by the uh, Nazgul, particularly the, the lord of the Nazgul, right? Over here, there's a mountain, right? Because the, the mountains come down like this, right? Uh, and there's a very steep path along the mountain to get up to here, and then there's another tower over here, you know, like a uh, fortress. Uh, and now, it's called... Kirith Ungul. And it's, I, I don't know if Tolkien explains this quite enough. Gollum keeps pretending like he doesn't know what the name of it is. Isn't it called Kirith Ungul? Faramir says. He doesn't want him to say that, okay? Kirith means pass. What does Ungol mean? Did we not meet a character in the Silmarillion whose name is Ungoliant, okay? So Ungol means spider. It means pass of the spider. That's why they never, neither in the book or in the movie do they quite explain that. But it is, it, that, that's the reason why Gollum keeps pretending he doesn't know the name of it. Because that's why it's called the pass of the spider, because Shelob is up there. And that's one of the reasons why Sauron is not too afraid, because that's a pretty darn good guy. Nobody gets past the evil Shelob. Right? Uh, and so, again, that's why, what, what is it? The Faramir too. What does it mean? Right? Um, Oh, and, and Faramir tells them that, you know, some kind of evil dwells up there, but they don't know what it is. Okay, but, you know, people speak in whispers of Kirith Ungul. Right? Watch out. Beware of that place. Dark magic. Look at page 632. Is this anybody's favorite? I'm sorry, I'm sorry. 646. Is this anybody's favorite poem about the Oliphant? It's almost kind of a riddle. It's great stuff. That's something to read to a little kid someday. Have you read that one to your, your little one? You should read them and see if they can guess what it is. I mean, you know, there's such a thing as an elephant. You don't tell them it's an elephant. You know, it's an elephant, right? Gray as a mouse, big as a house, right? Does anybody know if there's any truth to the fact that elephants are afraid of mice? I think that's probably an old wives' tale. Have you ever heard that? I don't know if it's true, but they say it all the time. In fact, they're, they're, you know, did any of you read that old famous children's story? where there's a kingdom that's overrun by mice, and so they bring in cats to get rid of the mice, and then the kingdom's overrun with cats. And then they bring in dogs or whatever, and finally they bring in elephants, right? And in the end, they bring back the mice to chase off the elephants, right? Then it, it ends, right? So. Oh. oh, really? Oh, that's cool. Ooh. Oh, yeah. 
would need another pestilential attack. Which state park is it? Is that the hill country? Where is it? Northeast Texas. Okay. Like on the border of Louisiana? Okay. Oh, that's neat. Ah, go to the hill country. Those are nice ones. Those are really cool. It's a beautiful place. It's very mysterious. Oh, wow. That's cool. I like that. Anybody ever want to be a ranger, like a park ranger? What do you think? You can live out you So you got that there. See? We do have one national park in Texas called Big Bend National Park. That's way down southwest. Uh, beautiful place, but it takes a long time to get there. Cadley. Oh, Cadley. C A D O? Caddo Lake, okay. Oh, okay. Oh, that's cool. So that's Indian. I'm thinking Cajun, but that's an Indian name. It's cool. <laughs> okay, uh, then, uh, again, notice on page 650, or, or well, very bottom of page 650, they're actually going through a place that's, that's, that's nice. It's called Ephilion. It used to be the garden area of that. And that's, you know, we're going to find that's where the rangers hang out. That area is still pretty good. It hasn't gone really bad. But notice, as they're traveling through, and of course the hobbits are like, oh, it's so wonderful, right? All the, you know, whatever, little petunias and buttercups are opening. But it says, the travelers turned their backs on the road and went downhill. As they walked, brushing their way through bush and herb, sweet odors rose above them. Gollum coughed and retched, but the hobbits breathed deep. And suddenly, Sam laughed for heart's ease, not for jest. See? Anything that is good to them is almost poisonous to Gollum. He hates it. Those of you who have read The Magician's Nephew, can you find a parallel there? Do you remember, Ellie? Oh, you, you? Queen Jadis? What do they hate that all the other characters love? Good. When Aslan sings, sings the, the song of creation that Aslan sings that brings Narnia into being, the kids and also the horse just love it. It's the most beautiful thing. But the two evil characters, Uncle Andrew, they're like they hate it. They, you know, if they could if they could go into a, a hole and hide themselves, they would. And they're you know covering their ears and stuff like that. And the witch hates the music, right? Uh, but, anyway. Uh, by the way, I just saw an unbelievable movie. If you want to watch a very difficult movie, but a good one, it's called Sound of Metal. And it's free on Amazon. If you have Amazon Prime, I think it's up for Best Picture. And it's about a heavy metal uh, drummer. It's hard to watch. It, it really is powerful, but it's kind of hard. I mean, ooh, because it, he goes deaf. And then we're kind of hearing it, and then he doesn't want to leave his girlfriend, and then there's a, a place, you know. It, it, he was an addict. He's not now. And he joins a sort of halfway house for addicts, but they're all deaf. Uh, and back and forth. It's, it's really powerful, but it's not always easy to watch. <laughs> but it's powerful. The, uh, no, it, it is hard. It is hard. I mean, well, you have to be in the right, in the right mood. But it, it does whew, dig into that. It's pretty powerful. Uh, then we also find as they're going through, I don't know if you picked up this little touch, but wherever they go where orcs have been, they always leave a mess. Okay? The, the other motto uh, of, of the Boy Scouts is leave, you know, leave no trace. Have you ever heard that? Okay? That means if you, if, you know, if you camp out, you don't leave garbage behind, you, you know, obviously you take care of your fire. But, even better when you found it. That's right. And it's very, very important. And the, the orcs do not do that. In fact, they go overboard in their destruction. They leave garbage and all that sort of stuff. They've destroyed the place. Uh, and they're, they're like the vandals. And you know, you know where the word vandal comes from? That was one of those barbaric Germanic tribes that took down the Roman Empire. You know, there were Goths and Visigoths, but one of them was actually called vandals. And that's where we get that word vandalism. Because like a lot of the barbarians, they just destroyed everything. Um, terrible. And, and we saw a new version of that uh, during one of those Iraq-Iran wars or something like that when the, when the you know, ISIS or whoever it was came in and they destroyed a lot of the old, um, you know, the, the old Babylonian ruins and stuff like that. Right? And of course, you know, they are idolatrous, okay, I mean, in that sense, I suppose, but still, it's just wanton destruction. How many of you just get angry when you see unnecessary vandalism? Like, like somebody opening their car window and throwing junk out. You ever seen that? Don't mess with Texas! Right? There's just something about that. Uh, 
and, and the, you know, the orcs embody that kind of thing. They lay waste to everything they touch. Anyway. Is this, is this everybody's favorite part, page 654? Uh, page 654 is when Smeagol picks up some uh, a brace of conies. Conies is the name for for, uh, for rabbits. A couple a couple of conies, a brace of conies, and he brings it to him. And what are we going to do with it? He said, "Oh, you know, we'll cook it." And he says, uh, "And we got to get taters." What's taters, precious? Oh, taters! They do that so well. And I love this. He calls them the gaffer's delight. Do you remember I told you what, what do you call something like Isildur's bane? Or 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 uh, or Durin's bane. Remember what I called what I called that part of speech? It's not a metaphor, it's not a simile. It's a I don't know if you remember that word. It's used in Beowulf all the time. It's called a kenning. You remember that word? It's a k. Uh, a kenning is like a. It's it's a kind of a metaphor. It's a figurative language, but it's like Isildur's bane. It, it tells a little story, and it means the ring. Uh, the most famous would be Whale Road. That's a, the Vikings called it the Whale Road. You know what the Whale Road is? is the ocean, the sea. That's the whale road. Or if they spoke of Freya's hair, and that's their, like, Venus, that was another word for gold. Right? So, I just, it's almost like he's making fun of it. Potatoes are the gaffer's delight. That's his name for his father, the gaffer. Uh, and by the way, I didn't have time to read all this stuff, but don't you like all the, the names that Sam has? You ninny hammer! Right? And it says, he kept attacking himself from the gaffer's, what does he call it? His word hoard. His gaffer's always teasing his poor son, you know, telling this and that, and he's sort of, he's sort of taken it to himself, hasn't he? Yeah, and he just does it all. Actually, everybody, yeah, when, I, when, I, when we take a stretch break here, take a few minutes. Oh, man. If I get more tired teaching from a chair, and when I get up, I get tired. But it's like, yeah.
But there's a new documentary out there where Kevin Sorbo is interviewing him. Have you seen it? Yeah. Have you seen it? It's really good. I actually had dinner with with John Lennox. I was I was at a dinner at a conference, and right next to me was John Lennox. And have you ever heard of uh, Kristen uh, Getty, the singer, the ones who did in Christ Alone, Keith and Kristen Getty? They're awesome, and, and you, you know the connection, right? Because Kristen Getty is uh, her maiden name is Kristen Lennox. He's the one that actually matched the two of them up. Pretty, pretty important getting those two together. Of course, you know C.S. Lewis too. You all know C.S. Lewis well. Oh, it's beautiful. Yeah, it's great, and in really intense words. I mean, they—they they really. I mean, they're not frivolous at all. You know, you know. I mean, Christ alone is what everybody knows, but they did a lot of other stuff. Oh yeah. Oh, he's crazy. <laughs> that's great, that's great. I love it. He's <laughs> so good. He's tough, man. I love that guy. Oh, yeah. In 21 minutes, he's great. He's great. He gets up there and speaks. I mean, he's, he's brave. He's brave. Yeah. Yeah. He's neat. Oh, he's 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 good. But uh, well, I was gonna say first, have you seen his video on YouTube, John Lennox, where he talks about like he remembers a lecture that he took, or that he went and saw one of C.S. Lewis's lectures? And, oh, that's right. He actually knew Lewis. That's right. Yeah, he's like he would he would start lecturing as soon as he starts talking. That's right. Yeah. Oh yeah, he's good. I don't have enough faith to be an atheist. That's his, that's his book. Oh really? Oh wow. Wait, wait for me for a conference or, or to teach here? For a conference, okay. Because the apologetics. Oh, that'd be great. Yeah, he's good. I didn't ask you if you ever did summit ministries. That's really good. That's up in, in, in Colorado, Manitou Springs, Colorado. It's a world view camp. Really good. Really? Have you ever heard of Nancy Piercy? Total Truth and Saving Leonardo and Love Thy Body? 
Oh, oh that's right. It's what the first, first, the last two weeks of May. Oh, that's right. For just a couple, and you could just do it. What is it? Five hundred dollars? Isn't a whole, or is it more? A little more. Oh, just audit. Yeah, because you know, yeah. It's good stuff. Oh, see, it's a good. Oh my gosh. Yeah, like, Marcos is the conference. It's, it's, and they get really mad, you know, when I speak at conferences, you know, I talk to the other, they, you know, they'll bring in a very expensive person. And they'll be like, do you want me to read this speech or this speech? Like, they only give two choices. Like, I've got like, you know, a bag of 50 speeches that I've done over the years. That's it? No, she's, she's more. She's, sometimes she reads, but she reads well at least. Like, she's, she actually engages the crowd. She just reads. She's good. Yeah, she's good. He would like her stuff. We have another guy named Mike Lacona who writes about the resurrection. He's very good. He, used to, he started by writing with uh, Gary Habermas. Yeah, he's really good. And they work together, and he's over here. So He's really good. Yeah, she worked with Luke Schaefer and with Chuck Colson. It's a cool place, man. All right. All right. Let us dive in. Potatoes! <laughs> Did they? Oh, it's so funny. The humor they got there. Oh, that's true, yeah. Um, cook them, mash them, cut it for the stew. What is it? The stew. I love it. Oh, did they? Okay, that does sound right. Yeah. That's your Twitter name. Oh, my gosh. Remember the other one they made a song out of? The, the, the Hobbits are going to Isengard. What is it? Yeah, Isengard. Oh, okay, yeah. But there's a, an, um, a special item that you can create. It's the disco file. And so it's like um, Frodo's file of light that you have. Oh, oh okay. It plays, uh, plays disco music with clips from the uh, lights from the, the movies that just play to this disco music. Oh, my gosh. Dance. Oh, that's great. Um, it's fantastic. You should, you should look up this song, The Lego Lord of the Rings Disco File. Disco File. Oh, my gosh. I love it. Like, Good stuff. And then there, there's that there's that weird guy that does it. And then they have uh, Saruman, uh, Saruman on top of, of Orthanc. It's great. Oh man. Anyway, wonderful stuff. Anyway, so the uh, uh, here's here's actually the place on, on page uh, six fifty seven that I mentioned where we get a little more clear of a sort of allusion maybe to uh, um, of um, Don Quixote. He says, um, let me see. Uh, They've met Faramir, and he asks him about the skulking fellow. This is the bottom of 657. That's, of course, Gollum, right? He had an ill-favored look about him. I do not know where he is. He is only a chance companion met upon our road, and I am not answerable for him. If you come on him, spare him. Bring him or send him to us. He is only a wretched, gangrel creature. But I, again, you can't imagine Elijah Wood saying any of these lines. But I have him under my care for a while. But as for us, we are hobbits of the Shire, far to the north and west, beyond many rivers. Frodo, son of Drogo, is my name. And with me is Samwise, son of Hamfast, a worthy hobbit in my service. And by the way, what does, um, I, I, you have to really know this, but what does uh, uh, Don Quixote always promise uh, Sancho Panza? Remember, he's going to be a governor of an, be a governor of an island. Okay? And who becomes mayor of a, hob a hobbit at the end? Okay, so that may be a, a funny reference to, to that. But anyway, um, so he says, uh, you know, they, they, they talk about it, and he mentions Boromir, and you know, all, all that. It must have been exciting the first time to read this, as you slowly realize that Faramir is Boromir's brother. Of course, the name might give it away. <laughs> you know, but, but anyway, still, it must have been pretty. And, and I think I mentioned, mentioned this before, that you can read the letters that Tolkien was writing to his son, who was fighting in World War II, while he was writing this. And he says... A young man named Faramir has just appeared in my book. I would like to meet him. So he, he, like, he wasn't really planning this. He just came. And the other, American, Shrebeard was the other one. He wasn't really planning. He just seemed to appear. He just came out of nowhere. Right? Anyway. You want to meet a giant? Faramir, he's great. He's great.
Yeah. yeah. And so, I mean, the ends were there, sort of, but what he did with Tree Bear and all of that, it's just, some of it just, I mean, you have the idea that, you know, yeah, I mean, because it seems like, remember, he was always mad at Macbeth because the trees didn't actually move. So it seems like in the back of his mind, he probably had this idea of ends or whatever moving, but the full character, I mean, remember, Tree Bear, uh, his voice is based on, on C.S. Lewis, he said the booming voice he had when he, when he would lecture and things like that. Well, really, that professor is really probably more based on Kirkpatrick, who was C.S. Lewis's tutor. Um, but the one that is partly based on Tolkien is his, his novel, Out of the Silent Planet. Ransom is like him. But when he got to the third one called That Hideous Strength, Ransom suddenly becomes Charles Williams, which clearly made Tolkien very jealous and upset. His other friend, what are you going to do? Oh, that's true. You're right. It is, it is Elwin. That's right. I didn't think about that, but... Huh. Yeah. Elwood. We need we need we need Dr. Grubbs here, man. He speaks that language. <laughs> Never had a class with him, did you? Dr. Grubbs, he's pretty cool. He does Beowulf. Did you have him? Yeah, he did, yeah, he's cool. The um Oh detective fiction, he's he's doing a although that that's that's an undergrad class too though. I did um oral literature with him, so great Yeah, those are good, yeah. Good stuff, man. Good stuff. Yeah. My son was impressed by you, but I had to tell him you were already married with the kids. He's like, oh, all these nice girls are already married. You know, it's amazing. You know, it's amazing. It was so fun to watch you too. Oh, could you see? Oh, that was a theater major for a while. Oh, really? Okay. <laughs> That wasn't planned, but like I said, you know, we, we've watched the movie so many times. Like I told you, uh, oh, you, you came late. Uh, I'm, I'm driving to San Antonio to spend the weekend, and we're going to go see The Two Towers, because it's re-released in 4K. So we're going to go see that. Well, they are, yeah. Well, I mean, when I mean redo, it's the same movie. They're just, they just upgraded it, and they're showing it in the big theater, big screen again. Yeah. There's, but, but, not, but it's not Netflix, it's Amazon. No, Netflix is doing Narnia. Yeah, Amazon's doing... Uh, yeah. We, I, we, nobody knows what they're going to do with Narnia, but they bought the rights to Narnia, and they better use them or the rights are going to run out. It, it was funny because almost immediately after Amazon acquired the rights to Middle Earth, Amazon jumped in and got got Lord of the Rings, got, got uh, Narnia. So it's almost like you know, let's compete or something like that. But neither one of them have done anything yet. But. Oh, no, I don't think it. Where'd you? There was a press release tonight about the Amazon series, the Sunrealm. Oh, okay. And they were talking about how they've been shooting since. Oh, okay, good. 2021, okay. Well, let's hope so. Yeah, that's right. It's supposed to be about the rise and fall of Numenor and the forging of the One Ring. It's going to be the Second Age. The good stuff. Well, I know, that's what I mean. Let's hope, yeah, they don't overdo it. Let's see. Uh, anyway, so, the, um, uh, so anyway, they, they go back and forth, and Faramir's questioning them, and, you know, Frodo shows very, very smart. He's not, he's not going to tell them all the, the, um, uh, all, all, he's not going to tell them all of his business, just slowly, bit by bit, but Faramir is very perceptive. He figures out what's going on. He figures out, you know, you, you quarreled with Boromir. Something's going on. Isildur's bane, whatever that is. I don't know what it is, right? Uh, as they're going. But again, so Tolkien, line 658. Um, uh, uh, the, the, okay. okay, basically what happens is, in the movie, they, they see the battle, and then they meet Faramir. In the book, they meet Faramir. Then Faramir goes off and has a battle. And then he comes back and they talk again. <laughs> okay, a little, a little more. The, the movie kind of you made it a little bit simpler. Um, but the uh, but um, anyway, just one thing about their meeting is kind of neat. Uh, the, towards the bottom of six fifty eight, they talk a little bit, but then he's got a fight, and he says, "Farewell," said Frodo Bowlow. Think what you will. I am a friend of all enemies of the one enemy. We would go with you if we halfling folk could hope to serve you, such doughty men and strong as you seem. And if my errand permitted it, may the light shine on your swords. And he says. The halflings are courteous folk, whatever else they be. 
And again, there, there's something, this courteousness in the midst of this, you know, wildness and these wild men that they're attacking the horror dream and the other ones uh, on their on their elephants and things like that. Uh, anyway, they fight, uh, and then oh gosh, there's so much I can do. Let me just see. I'm going to skip a little bit ahead. Uh, well, just one thing before we get to the next, the next uh, uh, chapter is on page 661. It's just really neat when, when they see the oliphant. Look at, uh, about halfway down the page, 661, look, look at the response of, of uh, Sam. It says, To his astonishment and terror and lasting delight, Sam saw a vast shape crash out of the trees and come careening down the slope. Right? And again, this is that word that both Lewis and Tolkien love, that numinous, right? Something that can be beautiful and terrible at the same time. Give us a sense of delight and also a sense of awe and wonder all mixed in together. And it's like, wow! So he's already seen the elves, now he gets to see an elephant. Oh, um, no, no. Uh, Mummik is their name for an elephant. Is what it is. That's what they're saying. Watch out, watch out! Uh, and the valor. Actually, we'll see something else uh, later. That, uh, that, uh, now, Faramir, okay, Faramir, those are the southern rangers, basically, right? The northern rangers were led by Aragorn up in the north, and the southern rangers are led by Faramir, and they're very much like what what people in British legend. This is the way they're described. They're they're dressed in green. They're living out in the forest. Does they sound like somebody? Yeah, it's gonna rabbit in his merry man. I, I think he probably had that in mind. Uh, they got their secret fortress, their lair that nobody knows. You gotta got to blindfold yourself, right? That sort of stuff. Uh, but anyway, they're 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 a fun group. Uh, uh, again, they start speaking. They start talking about uh, the sword of Elendale. That's all exciting. Uh, what's coming back and all that stuff. Um, uh, and and then <laughs> on page six sixty five, this is when it gets fun. Uh, Faramir is pressing Frodo too much, and it gets Sam upset. And Sam marches up, it's the, the top paragraph, and it says, See here, a uh, second paragraph, See here, Captain, he planted himself squarely in front of Faramir, his hands on his hips. Can't you see? Sam, See here, you know, look at that, okay? Don't you mess with my master. And he just gives him, like, what for? It's wonderful, and of course the movie does it so well. Uh, see, here, here's the difference, like I said, when I read the lines of Frodo, Usually I see Elijah Wood, but there are a few times that that's that. But it's always, uh, what's his name? Um, what was it? Sean Aston. It's, it's always Sean Aston. We always see him. It's, it's going to perfect. Um, so he says, uh, and he gives it to him like, like when, when a young hobbit gave him sauce. Don't be sassy with me, kid. Right? Kill ever sassy? You ever get sassy? She is an actress, but... Be sassy. Okay. Okay. So she's a good, good influence. A good influence on him. <laughs> and he just gives it to him, right? He says, see here. What are you driving at? Let's come to the point before all the orcs of Mordor come down on us. If you think my master murdered this Boromir and that ran away and then ran away, you've got no sense. But say it and have done. And then let us know what you need to do about it. But it's a pity that folks just talk about fighting, which um, the enemy can't let others do their bit in their own way without interfering. He'd be mighty pleased if he could see you now. Think, think he'd got, got a new friend. friend. And of course he does know it. The <laughs> enemy always, you know, remember, he's in the middle of enemy territory and he's going at him. And I love, it says, Patience, said Faramir without anger, do not speak before your master whose wit is greater than yours. Tell them. He still takes it though, right? And I do not need any to teach me of our peril. Even so, I spare a brief time in order to judge justly in a hard matter. Were I as hasty as you, I might have slain you long ago. For I am commanded to slay all whom I find in this land without the leave of the Lord of Gondor. Does anybody know who the Lord of Gondor is? <laughs> That's right, Mr. Dirkface, yes. Uh, that's always the favorite part uh, when we watch it, when Denethor burns on fire and goes down. My, my son's always like, flaming fireball of death, you know, he's laughing. He's like, ah! It's the most dramatic scene. And, but yeah, oh, I mean, he's bad enough in the movie. They make it in the, the novel, he's even worse in the movie. Uh, but he's bad. I mean, I mean, in, in the novel, he says one of the most horrendous words when his son is going off on that suicide mission. And he says, I hope you will think better of me, Father, when I return. That depends on the manner of your return. So, I mean, he's just bad. I mean, the movie doesn't exaggerate. It just draws out a little bit. But he is. Woo. 
And I don't know whether in the novel or the movie, I believe it when Gandalf says, your father loves you, Faramir, and will remember it before the end. What, about the time when he's going to burn him alive? I mean, for one second, Faramir, oh, you're alive, then he burns up. But, but uh, yeah, I, I don't know if that you know, really happens, but he tries. Uh, and you do understand, it, it, it's, it's a little bit clearer in the novel, but it's kind of in the movie, too, that part of Denethor's hatred is, is a kind of jealousy. I mean, he calls his son, you wizard's pupil. It's in the movie, too. Uh, and, and, you know, he, he feels like Gandor has, Gandalf has stolen his son. And, and, and he is, you know, Faramir, you know, wants to learn the lore and things like that. He, he reminds me of good, good, good Prince Caspian, who still loves the old times and all that. Um, I guess in that way, yeah. He wants to learn and stay strong and whatnot. And again, and, and a lot of people would agree with this, that in some ways the biggest weakness of the movie is it didn't quite catch Faramir. I mean, the actor was good at all, but we, we're missing some of his nobility. Well, we'll see in a moment that the speech that's so important that I wish they'd left in the movie. Cause it, it, yeah. Yeah, he's, he's not, I mean, he's not bad, and the actor did the best he could, but they didn't. And of course, you know, the, the movie also wanted everybody to be tested by the ring in a way, and so, you know, Faramir's never really tempted. Yeah. Good? Good? Well, I mean, he is, I mean, he, you know, his closeness to Gandalf, his learning, his love of the old things. Also, we'll, we'll see, I don't know if you realize this, but... This one of the closest references to just sort of religion is that Faramir's men actually say grace. Now, the way they say grace is, I'll, I'll show it to you because it, it's, it's an interesting um, thing. It's, uh, one second. Yeah, they, they, it's kind of a moment of silence. It's on page 676. Um, that's just before they're about to eat. Uh, page 676, about halfway down the page, it says, they were led to them, they, they were led then to seats beside Faramir, the hobbits, barrels opened, covered with pelts and high enough above the benches of the men for their convenience. Before, before they ate, Faramir and all his men turned and faced west in a moment of silence. Now you know where they're facing towards? I mean, they are facing ultimately towards Valinor, but they're really facing towards Numenor. And at one point on the island of Numenor, there, there was, was a very ancient temple to a Luvatar. That sort of, you know, uncut by human hands, that sort of stuff. Later on, it was perverted by Sauron. By Sauron. By Sauron. Um, and there were some people that said that even when the wave covered Numenor, the very tip still would show above the wave sometimes. And so in a way, they're looking. That's the closest we get towards a sort of mention of a Luvatar. And they, and they are. It's basically, they say grace. <laughs> and it says... Uh, Faramir signed to Frodo and Sam that they should do likewise. So we always do. We look towards Numenor that was and beyond to Elven home that is. In other words, Numenor and Valinor, the, the home, the original home of the elves. Actually, the original home of the elves was actually Middle Earth. Then they went to Valinor and came back. But anyway, uh, Elven home that is and to that which is beyond Elven home and will ever be. Right? So that's a, the closest religious sense we have here. Have, Have you no such custom at meat? No, 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 said Frodo, feeling strangely rustic <laughs> and untutored. But if we are guests, we bow to our host, and after we have eaten, we rise and thank him. That we do also. This wonderful sense of courtesy in this whole meeting is really uh, really played up uh, by Tolkien. So, so yeah, I mean, and I don't know that we're, he has clairvoyance per se, but he, he is, he does sense it, like he senses, like he has that weird... Uh, almost a dream, but it really happens, and the movie does it exactly like the book, where he's standing by the river, and he seems to see the boat with his, the body of his, his brother, Bor Boromir, going by, and he can see the, 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 you know, the, the broken blade and stuff like that, and then later on, the, the cloven horn washes up. But it, it really happened, because he said, I didn't wake up, and the movie shows it too, but it's almost like a dream, and it's almost real at the same time, but it's like a vision, a walking vision, whatever. Uh, but, but he is strong, and also remember that um, the the, um, the 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 riddle. Uh, uh, what is it? Uh, uh, and Imla dress it dwells. Remember, seek seek for the sword that was broken. And Imla dress it dwells. That happened. And, and it says that that dream it came once to Boromir in a vision, but several times it came to Faramir. He understood it better, and he should have gone. Right? Um, and so, so yeah, there there is definitely a, almost like a spiritual dimension to it. And, but. That's true. It is still there in him, in a way. Yeah. Yeah. 
Good, good. 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 And, and later, later do you remember, remember who, uh, f- uh, who, uh, 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 who who Sam tells me reminds of him? Him of? He says, you remind me, no? Of Gandalf. This is very interesting. We'll get to that. Uh, and, and, and so he, he does. You're right. He, he, he's like a throw. And, you know, Boromir is a super noble person as, I'm sorry, you, you missed uh, hearing Robert's uh, wonderful defense of, of Boromir. He is still a very noble person, but it's a little bit different. He still has a sort of rashness to him. And Faramir has a different kind. And they do a pretty nice job with the brothers in the movie, especially in the extended edition. We have that whole scene at us Gilead, which is a really good scene. Uh, and he tries. Boromir tries to stay, stick up for his brother. You know. Anyway. Um, by the way, the guy that plays Faramir in this plays the bad guy in The Iron Fist. Does anybody know what that is? You know, on, on Netflix, you've got you've got uh, Daredevil, uh, Je- Jessica Jones, uh, Iron Fist, and what's the other one? Luke Cage. Yeah. Uh, in the sec, I think it's the second scene. But in Iron Fist, the bad guy is, is this actor that played Faramir. What's that? Yeah, yeah, I know. He's kind of well. He's a, a strange kind of bad guy. He's kind of back from the dead. And he's, he's kind of odd, but it, it's it's okay. Um, the, none of them are, the Daredevil is the best one. But anyway, the uh, oh yeah, the Defenders was was cool. Yeah, they, they all got together. It's kind of fun. Um, okay, uh, so uh, oh, where I left off though, uh, we're on page six sixty five. Back six sixty five. It's, it's an important line. He says, Were I as hasty as you, I might have slain you long ago, right? For I'm commander without the lead. Then he says, But I do not slay man or beast needlessly, and not gladly, even when it is needed. Neither do I talk in vain. So be comforted, sit by your master, and be silent. Okay? Um, but again, it's very important that he is tender. When he has to kill, he does, but he does not kill needlessly, man or beast. He doesn't do it. In fact, his men say, we always have to check with you before we kill anything. You know? Because again, he's, he's a noble person. Right? And a wonderful description of him. A little bit farther down, it says, Frodo looks at me and said, yet he felt in his heart, well, first he tells him Boromir, Boromir was my brother. Right? And then he says, um, he says, do you remember anything? And then he says, yet he felt in his heart that Faramir, though he was much like his brother in looks, was a man less self-regarding, both sterner and wiser. So a little bit, which is not to say Boromir stuck up, but he is thinking about his own glory a lot, where uh, Faramir is less self-regarding, right? a little bit sterner, more serious, more grave, gravitas, uh, as the Romans say. Oh, Robert's there, I thought you left. It's like disappeared for a second. Okay. <laughs> He's, he's, hiding, he's hiding under the desk again. Clinton's a pretty scary guy. Man. He's hiding under the desk. <laughs> anyway, wonderful stuff. Okay, i got to keep going. I'm falling behind it. Okay, uh, oh, where are we? Okay, loaded need. And, then, and the next page is where he sees the image of his brother going down. I won't read that again. Um, they talk about the, the lady of the wood and all sorts of stuff like that. Uh, and he says... Um, uh, look at line six, page 667. He says, uh, middle of the page, You passed through the hidden land, said Faramir, but it seems that you little understood its power. If men have dealings with the mistress of magic who dwells in the golden woods, then they may look for strange things to follow. For it is perilous for mortal man to walk out of the world of this sun. And few of old came thence unchanged, he said. Now, if Gimli was here, he'd probably fight him. Right away, but Gimli's not here, so they're safe. Right? But that word "perilous" is a word that he uses all the time. In fact, Tolkien liked to refer to fairyland as the perilous realms. That's fairy, where it's kind of dangerous. You don't know what's going to happen in there, right? Uh, and it's you know it's perilous to go to a place that is mysterious. Watch out. You know, the the sun is where men live, right? The the, 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 the elves are under the moon and the stars, really because the moon came with the sun. Uh, and, then and then he says, Boromir, oh, Boromir, he cried. What did she say to you, the lady that dies not? What did she say? I just love it how, see how we pull back, we've met Galadriel, and have been there, and it's mysterious, but not as, but Faramir, she's the lady who dies not. Right? Suddenly we get an outside view, the, the way we felt when we met uh, your buddy uh, Amber. You know, we, we got that pullback view of, how perilous it is. And of course, that's what the, the, the fellowship thought before they went there too, okay? Let's be fair. What did she see? What woke in your heart then? Why went you ever to Lorelindorin? And it sounds like some Shrewdrew would say that's the, the way they call it. 
and came not by your own road upon the horses of Rohan riding home in the morning. Right? And he talks about uh, how he got the horn and now the horn lies broken in the lap of Denethor as we see it in the movie uh, over there. As he, uh, you know, his, his son says to him, you wish that I had died instead of Boromir. And he says, yes! Unbelievable! He says, yes. So like I said, he's just a man in the, in the, in the book ultimately. It's in the movie. Terrible. Uh, okay, oh, there's so much we can do here. That's it? Oh, that's great. Uh, boom, boom. He deserves it. Ah, that's it. Yeah. Every, everybody in person that you love to hate. Woof. Anyway, um, anyway, he goes, oh, there's so much I'm talking about. Um, so he says, uh, he, again, he starts to understand. He's been studying. He understands how, how, um, how, uh, um, um, uh, um, how his brother would be, um, want this. Uh, we learned something about his brother, brother for instance, on page uh, 670. Okay, I, I kind of said this before, but I don't know, like 2,000 years before, 1,500 years before, the last king, okay, Minas Tirith, okay, was the one that was owned or overlooked by, by, by uh, Anarion, Isildur's brother, okay? So Anarion was the one who had Minas Tirith, okay? It was his brother Isildur who had, you know, Minas uh, uh, um, Anor. That, uh, no, wait, Minas... Minas Anor, Minas... The name is going on my mind now. Uh, Minas Ithil, which means the Tower of the Moon, but now it's Minas Morgul. Okay, so you understand that... that, that so the kings of, of Gondor, the kings of Minas Tirith, were the heirs of Anarion, right? But the last of his race, the, you know, the last descendant, was the one who went foolishly to fight against the witch king, the god witch king, and he was killed, and Angmar, and was killed, and ever since that, like 1,500 years ago, it has been ruled by stewards until the true king returns. But the line of Anarion has been wiped out. So we have to turn over to the the, 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 the heir, heirs of Isildur, which of course Aragorn is. But the heirs of Isildur had ended up up in the north where they were. So that that's what we're waiting for. The only proper heir has to be an heir of Isildur, because an Aryan line died out. And we and again he's just telling all this. And this is a, a very important to give us insight into Boromir and Faramir. On the top of page six seventy, um, when they were told this, right, that, that the stewards had been running for like 1,500 years but waiting for the true king, then it says, This I remember of Boromir as a boy. When we together learned the tale of our sires, right, of our, uh, of our ancestors, and the history of our city, Minas Tirith, that always it displeased Boromir that his father was not king, because he's still steward. How many hundreds of years needs it to make a steward a king if the king returns not, he answered. He asked, few years maybe in other places of less royalty, my father answered. In Gondor, 10,000 years would not suffice. Alas, poor Boromir, does that not tell you something of him? I mean, that's that rashness of him. He wants to be the king, or at least he wants his father to be the king and not just the steward. Okay, but this, this is the way it was, right? Then we find out that he met the great pilgrim, Gandalf, when he came and looked at the parchments. And you know when he was looking at the parchments? In between the, uh, the party, when Frodo was 33, and when he leaves at age 50, right? So if, 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 um, if uh, uh, Faramir is about 35 now, what's 35 minus 17? 16? No, 18. Okay, so he's still like a teenager. That first time that Mithrandir Gandalf went down there to look. He's been back and forth. And he's kind of grown up and learned from him and things like that, right? Uh, and when he finds out he's dead, he can't believe it. On the bottom of 670, Mithrandir was lost. An evil fate seems to have pursued your fellowship. It is hard indeed to believe that one of so great wisdom and of power for many wonderful things he did among us, could perish and so much lore be taken from the world. Are you sure of this? And that he did not just leave you and depart where he would? Which turns out to be right. He's got a little bit of an intuition there. But he can't believe it. Someone that has both power and wisdom could just perish. This great lore master. Right? Uh, and then we go on to the next page, 671. Uh, and we, we hear you know, again about how Isildur was killed by orc arrows. And of course, who else was killed by orc arrows? Boromir, as in, oh, you guys missed the really cool. Uh, I'll, I'll have to show, I'll show it to you later. I'll take a picture. Of it. 
Oh, well, you were taking your you were taking your midterm this way. I guess you could still come. I just guess you could have. I know mean, I mean, you guys. It's it's pretty tired after you take a test. I don't want to put you. Up. What did you take? You took yours late. Yeah, yeah. You, you, well, you got a bunch of emails from me like uh, Ellie. Are you going to start? Then you too. You started a little bit late. But I mean, not late, but just. Like, what did, we, did you use the whole hour? Yeah. Okay, well, I guess I, I'm good. I pushed you. you know. But the, uh, you, you never know what it's going to take. But anyway, okay. Now, now, now we're getting to the part that, that is the core and heart of fair. This is what's missing in, in the movies. And by the way, if you watch the special features uh, about the making of, because, you know, why did they make Faramir be more tempted by the ring than he isn't? And they actually interview, what, what is it? It's, uh, it's uh, Peter uh, Jackson. What's his wife's name? Uh, uh, and, and Philippa Boyens, okay? It's the two women, and I forgot it, but, but his wife, you never see her. Like, she doesn't appear, I mean, she's shy, she never appears in any of the special features or anything, Peter Jackson's wife, but the writers were Peter Jackson's wife and this other woman named Philippa Boyens, and they interviewed her, and they asked her about that, and this is what she said. I wouldn't pick it up if it was on the highway? What's that all about? <laughs> she, like, just literally didn't get it. She just didn't buy it. It's really funny when she said, okay, well, at least you're following your convictions, okay, but it's really funny the way she said it. Ah. No, everybody's got to be tempted, right? They even added a part where, where Aragorn is just briefly tempted. Remember, uh, at, at the Hill of Seeing, he's offered, then he, he closes his hand, which was a good scene, actually. There's, you know, yeah, that's true. He just says no. That's true. They wouldn't pick up. Go away. They, they, they will accept the, he will accept the palant here. But they, there, there are just certain scenes in the movie that are so strong you keep looking for them in the book. But they're not actually there. What's going on? Wait a minute. No, there's got to be a better death scene. <laughs> but hold on. What was that? The better death scene. <laughs> okay, so now, at the, at the, sort of the middle of page 671, he talks about his brother. And he's got insight here. Okay, he says. Uh, what, what in truth this thing is, I cannot yet guess, but some heirloom of power and peril it must be, a fell weapon perchance devised by the Dark Lord. If it were a thing that gave advantage in battle, I can well believe that Boromir, the proud and fearless, often rash, ever anxious for the victory of Minas Tirith and his own glory therein, might desire such a thing and be allured by it. Is that not the most amazingly put together sentence? Let's read that again. I mean, sometimes it just, wow. That, that one sentence just captures everything, good and bad, about Boromir. I can well believe that Boromir, the proud and fearless, often rash, ever anxious for the victory of Minas Tirith and his own glory therein, might desire such a thing and be allured by it. Alas, that ever he went on that errand, I should have been chosen by my father and by the elders, but he put himself forward as being the older and the hardier, both true, and he would not be stayed. But fear no more. I would not take this thing if it lay by the highway, not where Minas Tirith falling in ruin, and I alone could save her, so using the weapon of the Dark Lord for her good and my glory. No, I do not wish for such triumphs, Frodo, son of Drogo. Uh, I wonder if my three MFAs, do you remember when we read Magician's Nephew and Diggory uh, brought back the apple, right? And Ashland says, if someone had stolen an apple and built a tree of protection against the witch, it would have worked, but it would have made Narnia into a cruel and evil empire like Charn, not the kindly empire I mean it to be. And so, again, the proper use of things. Um, he says, uh, so I won't pick it up. Uh, 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 for the good and my glory, no, I do not wish for such triumphs, Frodo, son of Drogo. Neither did the council, nor do I. I would have nothing to do with such matters. And then he says it. This, one of the greatest speeches, one of the few really good speeches that got left out of the movie. But it's at the core of who he is. For myself, are you looking for this man that would say something like this? Do, do, do men exist like this today? I wish. Maybe, I don't know. Wesley, maybe, I don't know. So you see if this is Wesley. For myself, first of all, I'm just amazed that there's anybody in the modern day whose name is Wesley. I mean, I just think that's kind of cool. But anyway, for myself... I would see the white tree in flower again. We'll find out later that the white tree is in the Gondor, but it's, 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 it's decayed. 
Right? And later on, it will be restored when Gandalf shows Aragorn where there's a cutting to get a good bit. But right now, it's, it's, it's dead. Um, he says, I would see it in crown again in the courts of kings and the silver crown return and Minas Tirith in peace. Minas Anor again, that's what it, the original name, which means Tower of the Sun. Minas Anor again as of old, full of light, high and fair, beautiful as a queen among other queens. Not a mistress of many slaves, nay, not even a kind mistress of willing slaves. This is what he would have, this beautiful. And then he says, this, this, this great line, War must be while we defend our lives against a destroyer who would devour all but I do not love the bright sword for its sharpness, nor the arrow for its swiftness, nor the warrior for his glory. I love only that which they defend, the city of the men of Numenor. And I would have her loved for her memory, her ancientry, her beauty, and her present wisdom. Not feared, save as men may fear the dignity of a man, old and wise. You see? I love what they defend. Okay? For Faramir, war is not an end in itself. He only loves it if it defends, right? Uh, that's like a good father who teaches his son, never start a fight, son, but always finish one. Okay? Um, if anybody had a parent that told you that, okay? No? You heard that? You heard that line? It's very important. What's that? <laughs> Like that. <laughs> right? okay, so, so, so again, this is this is what what was kind of missing. He is, and this was said the the the, 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 the scent of the old uh, Minas Tirith, what what Gondor used to be like. It's not completely fallen, but it's lost that kind of wisdom. It's still strong and it's mighty and glorious in many ways. But again, someone who is a a true romantic. And by the way, uh, there's a couple letters where where everybody thinks that the character Tolkien identified most with is Gandalf. But it's actually Faramir, he said, is the one he identified with the most. So fear me not. I do not ask you to tell me more. I do not even ask you to tell me whether I now speak nearer the mark. But if you will trust me, it may be that I can advise you in your present quest, whatever that be, yes, and even aid you. Frodo made no answer. Almost he yielded to desire for help and counsel to tell this grave young man whose words seemed so wise and fair all that was in his mind. Okay, so again, he yearns for the old days and he explains a little bit more where the other uh, passage. Oh, so much good stuff. Um, he explains a little bit more on page uh, 677. He gives us you know, the history, the background. He says towards the bottom of the page, we are a failing people, a springless autumn. You see that? It's dying. Right? Uh, and, and that's sort of summed up in the fact that both Denethor and Theoden's wives are dead, and then they lose one of their sons. Okay? Um, he says, The men of Numenor were settled far and wide on the shores and seaward regions of the great lands, but for the most part they fell into evils and follies. Many became enamored of the darkness and the black arts, some were given over wholly to idleness and ease, and some fought among themselves until they were conquered in their weakness by the wild men. Right? And, and he, he tells us later that there's three categories of men. They're the high men, and those are, well, the Numenorians, Gondor. The second are the Rohirrim, and then the third are the wild men, most of whom look bad. Right? And by the way, I can't remember where I read it, but somewhere in one of the letters or somewhere, apparently the Nazgul are three of the high men, three of the middle, and three of the low, make up the, the nine black riders. But I can't remember where I read that. It's you know, all, all these, but, 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 but um, Tolkien said it himself. Um, okay, he says, It is not that evil arts, 678, were ever practiced in Gondor, that the nameless one was ever named in honor there. And the old wisdom and beauty brought out of the West remained long in the realm of the sons of Elendil the Fair, and they linger there still. Yet even so, it was Gondor that brought about its own decay, falling by degrees into dotage, and thinking that the enemy was asleep, who was only banished, not destroyed. They stopped being vigilant. They stopped being prepared. They got lazy, okay? They weren't you know, uh, supple. 
death was ever present because the Numenorians still, as they had in their old kingdom and so lost it, hungered after endless life, unchanging. That was one of the questions that the MLAs wrote on. Um, again, the, the Numenorians uh, lusted after the immortality of the elves and even of the Valar, and it's because they tried to go to the forbidden lands that they were destroyed and everything went. So what he's saying is the same thing that happened to them is starting to happen to us because they still live longer lives even now. Um, and he says, death was ever present because the Numenorians, and this says, and now, he, now he's talking about the Gondorians. Kings made tombs more splendid than houses of the living. What people group did that most famously in human history? Say, yeah, the Egyptians, okay? They're very much like the Egyptians. Uh, oh, that's true. You know, I didn't think about that, but yeah, they're, they're kind of becoming like that, aren't they? Crazy guy. Um, kings made tombs more splendid. It's like the, the little dweeb in your high school suddenly becoming the king of the world. It's unbelievable. They're the most dweeby people of all time. The father said the ill jing people. Anyway, kings made tombs more splendid than houses of the living, and counted old names in the rolls of their descent dearer than the names of sons. Childless lords sat in aged halls musing on heraldry in secret chambers withered men compounded strong elixirs. That's like a, to, to give you extended life. Right? Uh, the elixir is, uh, uh, is the philosopher's stone, ultimately. Right? Um, or in high coal towers ask questions of the stars. And I, I think I already said this, but again, this is eerily like today where you've got these people lusting for immortality, even willing to put their mind into a computer, while nobody's having any children at the same time. It doesn't seem to go together, right? The way you live on forever is through your children, because we're mortal, right? And it's weird, at the same time they're lusting for long, long life, they're not actually having any kids. And he just hit it, and nail on the head. This, this is what's happening. It's even more happening in a place like Japan. Nobody's having kids at all, right? Have you heard that in Japan today, they sell more adult diapers than baby diapers. Now that shows you a civilization that's about to die. And see, our civilization will die because we have immigrants, but the Japanese are extremely ethnocentric. They don't want anybody coming, so they're just gonna die. It's a shame, because they make good movies. Anyway, the... Uh, <laughs> I know, that's why we keep my... I'm gonna we're gonna lose our... our, our uh, we're gonna lose our... Uh, what's that stuff? Yeah, I told you my daughter enjoyed Guy took her to the uh, place she took me. Hokkaido. And we had, uh, yeah, she enjoyed it. We had sushi. It's good stuff. Uh, okay. Uh, and then I went, but he explains it. And basically, what he's saying is that we, the Numenorians, are becoming more and more like the Rohirrim. Right? We're becoming men of the twilight. You know, still noble and strong, but losing the greatness. Of it. Now, he says on page 679, yet now, if the Rohirrim are grown in some ways more like us, enhanced in arts and gentleness, we too have become more like to them and can scarce claim any longer the title of high. We have become middlemen of the twilight, but with memory of other things. For as the Rohirrim do, we now love war and valor as things good in themselves, both a sport and an end. And though we still hold that a warrior should have more skills and knowledge than only the craft of weapons and slaying, we esteem a warrior nonetheless above men of other crafts. That would be like a university saying, we believe in scholar-athletes, but they just want athletes to win. Okay. Now, HBU still tries to keep the scholar-athlete. I've taught a number of them. Um, he says, such is the need of our day, so even was my brother Boromir, a man of prowess, and for that he was accounted the best man in Gondor. And very valiant indeed he was. No heir of Minas Tirith has for long years been so hardy in toil, so onward into battle, or blown a mightier note on the great horn. My son who plays the trumpet would like that. Right? You, 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 you judge the greatness of a man by the sound he makes on the horn. I think I told you that we have a, a ram's horn, and whenever we watch the movies as a group, my son, whenever he plays the Horn of Wrong, he played the Horn. The people that don't know jump out of their seat. So you get sensed around when you watch it at my house, man. It's really cool. The, uh, okay. All right, two more things and we will go. Let me see. Uh, um, then, then, okay. Then, again, it's, it's wonderful. Then they start talking again about the Lady of the Wood. And on the, towards the top of page 680, Sam gives one of the most beautiful tributes to the Lady. And it says... Then she must be lovely indeed, said Faramir, perilously fair. I, I hate these deaths. That always happens. You end up breaking your feet. I know. It's, it's, I don't know who designed these, these desks. Anyway, it says, perilously fair. And then he says, 
I don't know about perilous, it seems. It strikes me that folks takes their peril with them into Lorien and finds it there because they've brought it. But perhaps you could call her perilous because she's so strong in herself. You, you could dash yourself to pieces on her like a ship on a rock or drown yourself like a hobbit in a river. But neither rock nor river would be to blame. Wonderful. This, this insight. This, but it's still a simple person, this insight. Now, Borg, aha. Yes, now Boromir, you would say. What would you say? He took his peril with him? And poor Sam gets so guy. He said, from the moment he first saw it, he wanted the enemy's ring. Sam, what are you doing? He gives it away. Ay, ay, ay. He says, now, now, you. He says, he says, save me. There I go again. And then he quotes his father. Whenever you open your big mouth, you put your foot in it. The gaffer used to say to me, and right enough. Thanks, Dad. Okay, thanks, Dad. Anyway. Oh, dear, oh, dear. He says, now, look here. <laughs> Again, he's checking some guy like he's a child. Don't, Don't you go taking advantage of my master because his servants know better than a fool. You've spoken very handsome all along. Put me off my guard, talking of elves and all. But handsome is as handsome does. I, I, I think that would be Forrest Gump, wouldn't it be? And handsome is as handsome does. We say, now's a chance to show your quality. So it seems, he says. So that is the answer to all the riddles. The one ring that was thought to have perished from the world. And, and Boromir, Boromir tried to take it by force, and you escaped, and ran all the way to me. And here in the wild I have you, two halflings and a host of men at my call, and the ring of rings, a pretty stroke of fortune, a chance for Faramir, captain of Gondor, to show his quality. Ha! And then he stands up for a moment, right? And they get nervous, and he says, Ah, alas, Boromir. And he said, Did you not hear what I said? Not if I found it on the highway. Would I take it? Right? I am not such a man, 681, Sylvate, or I am wise enough to know that there are some perils from which a man must flee. What character in the book of Genesis understands that there are some perils from which a man must flee? Joseph, okay? Male fantasy, whatever, beautiful boss wife comes at you, right? And he runs off and actually runs off naked and then gets accused. Poor guy. Can't win, right? Uh, but again, there are some things I will not do it. He says, sit at peace and be comforted, Samwise. If you seem to have stumbled, think that it was fated to be so. Your heart is shrewd as well as faithful and saw clearer than your eyes. For strange though it may seem, it was safe to declare this to me. It may even help the master that you love. It shall turn to his good if it is in my power. So be comforted, but do not even name this thing again aloud. Once is enough. Fight. Don't say it again. Right? You are a new strange people to me. And then on the, 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 the top of the next page, 682, or middle of the page, he says, Yes, sir, and you showed your quality, the very highest. I just love that moment. Right? You showed your quality, the very highest. At the end, Faramir smiled, a pert servant, Master Sam Wise. But nay, the praise of the praiseworthy is above all rewards. Yet there was not in this to praise. I had no lore or desire to do other that I am done. I'm not even tempted by it. I know it's wrong. Then, ah, well, sir, said Sam, you said my master had an elvish air, and that was good and true. But I can say this. You have an air, too, sir, that reminds me of, well, Gandalf of wizards. Maybe. Maybe you discern from far away the air of Numenor. Ooh, that's a good way to end. Now, next week, uh, uh, we are going to go over Beowulf, okay? Yeah, we'll go ahead and please make sure you bring your course pack because there's a four-page handout that I'm going to take you through, okay? And I'll, I'll mention a few passages from Beowulf, but I just want you to see and then and bring this book too because whatever time we have, we'll try to finish book four so we can move into the uh, five and six next time. So, good job, everyone. It's exciting. Okay. We made it.